Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. There is probably no cryptid out there that is as cited, talked about, and as well known as Bigfoot. It is the rock star of cryptids, the one that even people with no interest at all in cryptozoology have heard of, right up there with the Loch Ness Monster. Ask most people what they think these creatures are, and you will more likely than not get the answer that they're some sort of massive, undiscovered, ape-like animal that lurks in remote areas of the world. Yet, what if Bigfoot is, at least in some cases, no animal at all? Or at least not like any known by us? What if these creatures are something from not only beyond our understanding, but from beyond our very reality? In the late 1800s, London's East End was a place that was viewed by citizens with either compassion or utter contempt. Despite being an area where skilled immigrants, mainly Jews and Russians, came to begin a new life and start businesses, the district was notorious for squalor, violence, and crime. Prostitution was only illegal if the practice caused a public disturbance, and thousands of brothels and low-rent lodging houses provided sexual services during the late 19th century. At that time, the death or murder of a working girl was rarely reported in the press or discussed within polite society. The reality was that ladies of the night were subject to physical attacks, which sometimes resulted in death. However, the series of killings that began in August 1888 stood out from other violent crime at the time. Marked by sadistic butchery, they suggested a mind more sociopathic and hateful than most citizens could comprehend. Jack the Ripper didn't just snuff out life with a knife. He mutilated and disemboweled women, removing organs such as kidneys and uteruses, and his crimes seemed to portray an abhorrence for the entire female gender. What many do not know is that four years after the Whitechapel murders, another Jack the Slasher arose to mutilate the innocent. But this Jack's stalking grounds were New York City. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of Fantasy. Inner Sanctum Mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. And in between the stories, I bring you some of the best dark, creepy, and horrifying old-time radio shows from what I've collected over the years. If you're new here, welcome to the show! While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness.
M and J Audio Theater presents Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Moor. Right in. Yeah. Uh, do have a seat, won't you? Uh, there. Uh, you are comfortable, I trust? Well, good. I am Chet Chatter, the morgue attendant here. I'm so glad you dropped in. I have quite a story to tell you today. It is about a man from Biloxi named... Elmer Corn. Yes. I have uh, quite a few stories about this man. Yeah. Now, let's see. It was late February on a Tuesday, and Mr. Corn was enjoying a week's vacation from his work of manure hauling. If I remember correctly, it was around 11.30 a.m., and Mr. Corn was sleeping in late. A rare privilege for a man who usually awakens at 5.30. Oh, bad gummit. Uh, okay, I'm awake. Okay, keep keep your britches on. I'm coming. Uh, uh, hello? Elmer! Elmer! Oh, howdy, Miss Maddox. How's your lower back? Oh, what, what's wrong? You, you out of toilet paper again? Rats, Elmer! Rats the size of small cats, Elmer! Save oh. me! Wow. Rats the size of small cats, you see. Elmer! Yes, Elmer! Now, Miss Maddox, you ain't been fooling around in them mushrooms in your backyard, have you? Oh, okay. Now, okay, now, now you just settle down. Okay, I'll be right. I'll be right over, Miss Maddox. You, Miss Maddox. Miss Miss Maddox. Dad gum. I better hurry. Come on, Bessie. Let's start now. Uh, come on now. Get going, you honorary devil. Come on. I'm here, Miss Maddox. Uh, uh, Miss Maddox, you okay? Look at him, Elmer. Look at him. Angel of mercy. Oh, it's all over the place. Save the furniture, Elmer. Uh, yeah. Save me. Save me, Good Lord, I, save me. I'm sorry I ever doubted you, Miss Maddox. Don't be sorry. Just save 30 me, 30 or 40 of them things. Oh. oh. Big, too. Oh. oh, my God. Look at oh. that one right there. That's the size of a chihuahua or something. Good Lord. When I was talking to you over the phone, they just ate the legs out from underneath uh-huh. the chair. They just ate it all, and I'm standing on this table now. Huh. <laughs> oh, Elmer. Boy, they never ate heard it. of a rat doing something like that. Uh, oh, but will you just stay uh, up on that countertop, Miss Maddox? They can't get to you yeah, there. Yeah, I'll make sure of it. Okay, Elmer. Okay. Boy, uh, look at them. Oh, that warts the oh, boils all over oh, them. Oh, look at the claws on the them. Claws, like Elmer, a mole. The claws. The claws my face. Say, listen, Miss Maddox. Yeah. Did you try sick and fluffy on him? No, I didn't try that. Yes, him. He's in the other room. In the other oh, okay. room, Elmer. All right. Him. Call him or something, Elmer. Here, Fluffy. Oh. Here, Fluffy, old boy. Right. Fluffy, Fluffy. Come here, Fluffy. Fluffy, stick the rat. I... Stick the rat, well, Fluffy. I... Stick him. I, I, I think you see the rats, Miss Maddox. Oh, yes. Had a boy, Fluffy. You get them rats. There you go. There you go. Hey. And a boy, Fluffy, tear them rats from them to them. Yeah. Wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Jiminy. Them rats pitched that cat through a window. 
Oh, I, I'm, I'm awful sorry, Miss Maddie. Fluffy was a cute little kitty, too. It's a pity to go that way. I, I'm going to get even for that, though. You just watch me. You got a hunk of cheese in the icebox? Yeah, Elmer, help yourself. Well, good. I got a can full of gasoline in the back of my truck. Okay. All right. Come on now. Y'all want this hunk of cheese? <laughs> well, y'all gonna have to come outside to get it. You the least carrying a little dirt bag? You said it, Elmer. All right. Here you go. Chow down. Wow. I'll tell you something, Miss Maddox. Them yeah. there are some versatile rats that can throw a cat through a window. They sure Let's are. Let's just see how versatile they are when the heat's poured on them. Oh. Yeah, it's okay. awesome if there's a gasoline. Gasoline. <laughs> okay, Miss Maddox, stand back uh, now. Yes, sir. I'm fixing to yes. torch this vermin. This here's for Fluffy. <laughs> yeah. Cook, you ugly little devil. Wonderful, Elmer. Wonderful. I'd barbecue them, Miss Maddox. They won't be bugging you no more. That's terrific, Elmer. No more rats. Well, oh. I, well I'm Thank glad you. to do it. I'm just sorry about Fluffy. Oh, darn it. Don't mention it. Goodness. Well, I'll I tell you what, Miss Maddox. We'll have a memorial service late this evening, okay? Oh, Elmer, that'd be great. Just dandy. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, oh. What was that? there. This house down the road, it, it just blowed up. It sure did, Elmer. I'll, I'll see you in a little while, Miss Maddox. i got to go check this out. All right, sonny. Uh, things are certainly happening quickly, aren't they? <laughs> uh, one thing's for sure, this is certainly no boring vacation for Mr. Korn. <laughs> Cecil! Cecil, what in the world happened? You okay? Yeah. Elmer, my house just blew up. I know. I, I saw it from Miss Maddox's house. Good Lord, what in the world happened, Cecil? I don't know. I was just out repairing my motorcycle. Pardon me, fellas. And all of a sudden, boom. Good Lord, Pardon it was an explosion like I'd never seen. Pardon me. I'm Lester Taylor. I'm the fire chief. Howdy. I've just been inspecting underneath your house here, and yep. I found this severed gas line. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Look yeah. That, baby. Whoa. Whoa. Huh. Looks Dang. like it's been chewed in, too. Sure yeah. does. But then again, that's pretty impossible. Yeah. Uh, well, Mr. Uh, Ferris, we're going to salvage what we can. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Bye-bye. That's a, that's a tough break, Cecil. I, I'm really sorry. I don't know how to tell you. Well, I need to call my insurance man, Elmer. Will you take me to your house? Oh, sure thing, Cecil. Sure thing. Side all right. It, it's a terrible thing to witness. Your house burning down and everything. And we can just get you away from all this. Come on over. Thank you, Elmer. All right. Here we are, Cecil. Yeah. You're welcome to stay here as long as you need to. I'm going to go in the front yard and get the paper, all right? Just just hold on a sec. I'll be using your phone, Elmer. Uh, okay. Well, let's see here. Oh, that paper's way out there. Boy, that paper boy's got a pitching on. Uh, okay. Well, I wonder if there's going to be any good news to read today. He's a alley What the... Hey, that gum, the ground's shaking it. What the hell? Hey, the ground's swallowing me up. Ah, good Lord. Cecil, help me out. Ah, I'm slipping. I'm slipping in the earth. Good Lord. I'm falling. Ah, ah. Ah, dead gum. What'd I fall into? Huh. Looks like a... Looks like a tunnel. I mean, the ground just opened up from under my feet, and I just... Uh, uh say... Say, say so! Yeah! Say so, come here! What are you doing in that hole, Elmer? Huh? Oh, not much. Just contemplating the universe. How'd you get down there, Elmer? I don't know. The ground just opened up, and I fell into this thing. Reach in the back of my truck and get a... Get a rope, Okay. 
Okay. In my toolbox. I'll get it. Throw it down here. All right. Huh. Sounds like this tunnel goes far. Can't see much. The light don't reach very far. Uh-oh. Oh, my good Lord. Rats. Sounds like thousands of them. Oh, the seashell! Yeah, what? Hurry up with that rope! I'm getting it. Hold your horses, Elmo. There's go. rats coming after me, Cecil. All right. Thousands. Elmo, say, look. Uh -uh. Hurry up. Here it comes, Elmo. Okay. Here it goes. All right, I got it. All right, I'm, I'm tying it around my waist. Oh, my God. All right, hurry, Cecil. Pull me up. I'm too heavy, Elmo. I can't pull you up. What do you mean you can't, Cecil? I'm too weak. I why you malnourished idiot? Put some muscle into it. Oh, get off my leg, you filth! Get off, man! Come on, they're eating me alive, Cecil. Tie to the back of my trailer, hit you fool! Pull me out of this thing with the truck! Hurry! I'll do it, Elmer. Hold your horses. Get off! Get off! It, it's working. It's working, Cecil. That's it, boy. Put the gas on it. It's, uh, it's working. Uh, uh, uh. Dad, come it. Oh, boy. Elmer. Hey. Elmer. Hey, thank you, Cecil. You saved my life, boy. Yeah? There was a sea of rats down there. Wow. Just a sea of them. Uh -huh. Big ones, too. Biggest dogs, I swear. Yeah. I, I, I'm real sorry about calling you a malnourished idiot and all that. I thought I was about to become rodent fodder. You understand. Well, listen, Elmer, we're pals, all oh, right? Well, well, thank you. We're just friends. Look, I'm going to go inside and call Bernie Edwards. He runs a gasoline truck. Maybe he can help us out. Well, well Elmer, what are you going to do? Well, just never your mind, Cecil. I know what I'm doing. Watch uh, that hole there and make sure none of them gigantic rats crawl out. Okay. Elmer raced to the phone and explained the rat problem to his friend. Soon, a convoy of ten tanker trucks arrived and began pumping great amounts of gasoline into the rat-filled tunnel. Well, how's it going, Bernie? You fellas almost finished? We're on the last tank now, Elmer. Good. Say, Elmer, what? you know it took a lot of tanks to fill up in their tunnels. Yeah. They must be all under Bloxy. They are, they are. One of them goes under Miss Maddox's house, and one went under Cecil Ferris's house. One of them chewed one of his gas lines in, too. Well, over Dad Gum. Say, see, Elmer, how are we going to pay for all this? Well, this ain't no time to talk about financial difficulties there, Bernie. We'll pay for that gasoline somehow, even if we have to take up a collection. I promise you. But right now, I think it's time to torch them rats. All right, fellas. I think that's enough gasoline. Let's put the fire to them. The men used torches to ignite the river of gasoline flowing throughout the tunnel. Instantly, the sound of screeching rats filled the air. The stench of burning flesh was everywhere. The fire burned for ten hours before it gradually died down. Y'all did a real good job, fellas. Thank you, Elmer. I think we frickers eat most of them ugly critters. Yeah. 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 I think them rats were out for flesh, so I, yeah. I bet you saved a lot of lives. Well, well thank Glad you. to thank do it, Elmer. Sure. Glad to do it. Well, y'all did it. an excellent job. Uh, when the fire cools down, we'll go down in them tunnels and kill what's left of guns. What do you say? All okay. Right. We'll do it. Elmer. All right. Elmer, there's a Cadillac pulling up in your driveway. Oh, that's a shiny thing, ain't it? Huh. Elmer. Elmer. Yeah. That's a brand new Cadillac. Well, dead gum. Dead gum. It's one of them big city folk. Well, don't act, don't act like you never seen one before, Cecil. Straighten up. Don't act like a hick. He's got a tie and everything. Shh. Oh, oh, all, right, all right. I'll do the talk. Right, right. Excuse me. My name is Dr. Van Zimmer. I'm from Plimco Laboratories. Well, uh, well, pleased to meet you, Mr. Van Zimmer. I'm Elmer Corn. This here's my friend Cecil Ferris. Howdy. 
Well, Sorry we smell like gasoline. We hadn't had time to wash up yet. Oh, it's quite all right. Uh, we understand that you've been having a rat problem here. Well, uh, well, we did, sir. And that was an understatement. We was knee-deep in the ugly things. But, but I think we got them under control. Oh, good. That is excellent. You see, Mr. Corn, unfortunately, Plimco is responsible for the rodents. Oh, yeah? Well, how? We at Plimco test the effects of various chemicals on laboratory rats. Oh. For instance, cosmetics, bathroom cleansers, etc. Yeah. And then for a fee, we send the lab results to various corporations. Well, uh, what's that got to do with our rat problem? You see, Plimco purchased a few acres of land here in Biloxi about five years ago. Oh. We've been using this land to bury dead laboratory rodents. Oh, yeah. I guess that was Bernie Edwards' place, wasn't it? He sold that place to, to pay off the loan he took out on his farm. That is correct. We believe that over the years, a few rats were buried alive by mistake. Oh. oh. We've studied the specimens, and we think the surviving rats made it with moles. Made it with moles? Yes, moles are rodent-like creatures that dig under the ground. Uh, y- yes, sir, I-, I know what moles are. I ain't as stupid as I look. But, uh, I mean, you're trying to tell me them things were mole rats? It's worse than that, I am afraid. The chemicals we used on them have mutated their growth glands. Oh. So what you have here are basically giant mutant mole rats. Jiminy. Giant, you say? Yes, that is correct. Uh, j- just how big do they get? Well, that is hard to say. We have studied one specimen that weighs over 250 pounds. Great gobs of mercy, he said. Well, listen, Mr. Van Zimmer, I, I think we killed off most of them. Oh, and we are very, very grateful, Mr. Korn. You have saved Plimco from a lot of paperwork. Oh, and the lab will pay for all damages and expenses, too. Oh, that's a relief, Mr. Van Zimmer. Say, did you hear that, Bernie? Yeah. The gasoline's paid for. All right, Elmer. And it looks like you're going to get a new house, Cecil. Well, I'll be dead go. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Van Zimmer, it takes a big man to admit he's made a mistake. And it takes a very big company to pay for the mistake, too. Uh, Good heavens. Uh-oh. What oh, is this? It's not another trimmer. Does this trimmer thing happen often? Well, well, the last time this happened, Mr. Van Zimmer, I fell through a hole in the ground. Elmer! Elmer, look over huh? there! Look! What is it, Cecil? Look at it, Elmer, look! Huh. Holy moly, he exclaimed. Look at the size of that thing thrown out of the ground. That is a big rat. Big as a double wide trailer. Elmer, what are we going to do? I I, I don't know, Cecil. I'm busy peeing on myself at the moment. Oh. Say, Say, Cecil. Yeah. Right in the back of my house. There's a junk pile back there. Get me a piece of thin pipe about an inch and a half in diameter. Hurry. Inch and a half. Inch and a half in diameter. Be right say, back. Say, say, Bernie, you, you got any gasoline left in one of them trucks? We got about half a tank, Lou. Oh, good. Here you go, thank, Elmer. Thank you, Cecil. Thank you. What are you going to do, Mr. Corn? Well, Mr. Van Zimmer, I figure if I can attach this yeah. piece of pipe to the end of this gas line... Uh-huh. And I could jab it into the side of that rat. Yes. We could pump that sucker full of gasoline. Oh. Like intravenously. I see. Yes, I think I see what you mean. Being a spark or something, we could blow that sucker up. Oh, I, I see. know this sounds crazy, but I'm playing this whole thing by ear, you understand. Well, it sounds like a very good idea, Mr. Corn. Thank but you. how are you going to pierce the side of the rat without it eating you first? Well, it... It's kind of dangerous, Mr. Van Zimmer, but if, if someone could distract a rat, I could sneak up on it and, and shove this thing into the side of it. Don't look at me, Elmer. Well, somebody's got to distract it. Mr. Corn, I am partially responsible well, for I... this. I would distract the rat. Well, that that's very admirable and brave, Mr. Van Zimmer, but uh, you're going to have to yes. be careful. You're going to have to keep that. a good distance away from that thing. Mm. Stick your tongue at it, scream at it, yes. get it interested in yes. you, and I'll run up on it as quick as I can and jab that thing into it. All right, all right. Let's, well, are you ready? I'm ready if you are. All right, let's go, let's go. All right. That rat! That rat! Over here! Yeah! Over here, right? Good! Hey. Good, Mr. Van Zimmer, good! The rat sees you. Keep it up! Cecil! Cecil, go into my bedroom closet. I've got some bottle rockets from last New Year's. Bring them here, okay? Okay! All right! 
Okay, Mr. Van Zimmer, keep distracting him. I'm fixing to shut this pipe hey, into him. Hey, look at me. All right, you foul-smelling rodent. Take this. Mr. Van Zimmer, I got the pipe into him. Run! Run like hell! Get out of the way! Wait a minute! Look out, Mr. Van Zimmer! He's behind you! Oh no! Let go of that man! Let go of him, you creature! Oh no! It's eating him! Oh, the inhumanity of it! Let's don't waste no more time, fellas! Bernie, start pumping gas into that thing. Okay. The fuel truck began pumping 250 gallons of gasoline into the mutant rat as it dined on the remains of Mr. Van Zimmer. When the truck was exhausted of its fuel, the pumps were shut down, and the bloated rodent began crawling sluggishly towards them. Mr. Corn carefully aimed a bottle rocket at the mouth of the creature and lit the fuse. All right, everybody stand back. This thing is fixing a lark. Be sure it's aimed at the mouth. Good idea, Cecil. All right, everybody duck. This is liable to be a big bang. Gross, Amber. Disgusting. Gross. Yeah. Let's take cover, boys. Oh. Everybody in my house. Okay. Yeah. Later, in the backyard of Miss Maddox's house, a touching memorial was taking place. We're all gathered here today to pay our final respects to our dearly departed Fluffy the Cat. He was a fine cat, Elmer. Just a fine Yes, him. He certainly was, Miss Maddox. A dear kitty, fluffy, white, and cute as a bug. He'd come up against you and rub and go to sleep in your lap and purr. I'll always remember Fluffy, and I know if there's a heaven for cats, well, he's up there, and he's chasing rats, and, and this time I'll bet he's winning. And I think while we're at it, we should also mention Dr. Van Zimmer, that fella from that laboratory that, that helped save Biloxi from a giant rat. He gave his life. I don't know. I, I didn't know either one of them very well, Fluffy or Dr. Van Zimmer, but I know one thing. I'm never going to forget him. Never. That was real touching, Elmer. Real touching. <laughs> That was touching, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, and now they're rid of their rat problem. If only I could say the same for this creepy place. <laughs> the morgue is just filled with the little beasts. Uh, fortunately, I've set traps. Oh, uh, there goes one now. It looks like I'll have dessert tonight. <laughs> Oh, oh, that was a disgusting joke. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh, please don't leave now. Uh, I didn't mean to offend you. Uh, well, if you must go, uh, do return, though, won't you? Uh, until then, pleasant dreams. You have just heard Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Today's installment, Elmer vs. the Mutant Mole Rats. For correspondence, sent to M&J Audio Theater. P.O. Box 252, Mejia, M-E-X-I-A, Texas, 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities to actual persons, and that includes Mutant Mole Rats, is purely coincidental. by M.J. I'm
Audio Theater. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built. The traditional assumption concerning hairy hominids such as Bigfoot is, of course, that they are biological entities, flesh-and-blood creatures of a species that has simply not been discovered and properly described by science yet. In this paradigm, these are living, breathing animals hiding out in the remote wilds of our planet, skulking about in the shadows and skirting about out just beyond our ability to find them, constantly evading and confounding us. In many ways, this seems to make sense. After all, there are many examples of such robust ape-like creatures and early versions of Homo sapiens in the fossil record of some areas of the world that could provide a link to an explanation for what's been seen. There are also many fairly large animals throughout history that have managed to remain hidden and which long inhabited the same realm as cryptids before their eventual discoveries. On the surface, it all seems at least possible, that relic populations of hairy bipeds could be out there, tucked away in the remote wildernesses of our planet, away from our prying eyes and rampant exploration. Yet in recent years, the age-old entrenched idea that Bigfoot and other creatures like it could only be biological animals has experienced more and more criticism from both skeptics and a few cryptozoologists alike. The most commonly stated problem is a lack of any fossil evidence in many of the areas where some of these entities have been seen, such as North America, Australia, and, bizarrely, England. This is actually not a major setback in and of itself, as fossils do tend to be very rare in the first place, with a rather incomplete record, and we are constantly finding whole new prehistoric species through newly found fossils. The problem is that there has been no reliable fossil evidence of anything even remotely like Bigfoot in many of the places where they are routinely seen. These creatures would not exist in a vacuum. There should be at least something like a primate that could be somewhat connected to Bigfoot, yet there is nothing. In this sense, the problem is not necessarily that there are no fossils of Bigfoot, but rather that there is a complete void of anything in the record of North America and some other locations that could even be tentatively associated with something like it. With the rather sketchy nature of fossils to begin with, it's not necessarily the nail in the coffin for a flesh-and-blood Bigfoot, but it is a rather glaring anomaly to contend with. Another thing that seems to be a strike against the notion of a biological Bigfoot is simply that these creatures have been seen absolutely everywhere, and by scores of people from all walks of life in increasingly urbanized areas. Look through sightings reports archives from organizations such as the Bigfoot Field Research Organization BFRO, and you'll find that there are hundreds and hundreds of sightings of these creatures from all over. At times it seems as if Bigfoot is spotted even more than some actual known animals, such as moose, cougars, bears, wolverines, and so on. Taking the sheer number of sightings reports into account, 
It's increasingly difficult to hold on to the notion that these are elusive and rarely seen creatures relegated to isolated remote areas where they can hide from mankind, for if they are hiding, they're doing a very bad job at it, as they're spotted all of the time. If even half of these reports are genuine, then this is actually a rather well-witnessed large animal, not some barely glimpsed specter. Bigfoot is apparently widespread as well, as then you have the fact that these reports come in from pretty much everywhere, including places where they have no right to be at all. Every single state of the Union has Bigfoot reports. Yes, including Hawaii. Bigfoot-like creatures have also been spotted in other unlikely places as well, including, as I mentioned, England and Australia, neither of which have anything whatsoever in their natural history at all to suggest an animal such as this should be there. Yet, there they are. Why should this be? We'll find out when Weird Darkness returns. You shut yourself in. The lights are out, and you're listening to Weird Darkness. But suddenly, you get that feeling you're not alone. You don't know what might be under the bed, or in the closet, or in the attic, or in the room with you. You don't dare try to sleep now. You're too scared to. If you doze off, you might be vulnerable to the creatures who haunt your dreams. That's just one more reason to have weird dark roast coffee in the cupboard, because you just never know when you might need it. Weird dark roast coffee contains deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness. Each bag is fresh roasted to order by Evansville Coffee, and delivery is free for your first order. Just use the promo code WEIRD. You can find a link to it at WeirdDarkness.com. Grab a bag before something else grabs you from the dark. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Warfare, espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, The Trojan Horse, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. August 1942. Report to OSS headquarters in Casablanca from Agent Henri Fontaine in France. Contact with girl Gabrielle Monet was made in the Bluebeard Cafe in Paris. I went there alone on the evening of the 15th. 
and sent her a note with a waiter asking her to come to my table when she'd finished her song. Then I sat and waited. German officers were spread about the room as they were spread about all of occupied France. <laughs> I wondered what they would say if they knew why I had come. You send me this note, eh? Oui, mademoiselle. Will you join me? Why not? I drink with anyone these days. Yeah. What will you have, eh? What have you? Let me taste from your glass. It is very bad wine. Huh? Well, you are right. Oh, the only time a girl may get good wine nowadays is when she drinks with the Bosch. Ah, never mind, I'm not thirsty. I enjoyed your song. Is that what you wanted to tell me? I think you are wasting your time here in Paris. Ah, Paris is wasting our time on Paris these days. I can offer you a better position in Casablanca. What did you say? Who are you? My name is Henri Fontaine. I too have a good position with the American OSS in North Africa. What are you saying? Before the Germans came to France, I was a poor poet. They did me a service. Now I'm a rich spy. You sit here in a room full of Germans and tell me this? What makes you think I will believe you? What makes you think I won't turn you over to the Germans if I do, <laughs> eh? Mademoiselle, I am not such a brave man. Neither am I a fool. We have kept you under observation for months. We know you better than you know yourself. Is there anything you'd like to know about yourself? What do you want of me? On our side, we have only the very best. Forgerers, counterfeiters, cutthroats, and uh, spies. <laughs> Will you join us? Ah, uh, just tell me what you want me to do. Agent Henri Fontaine in France to Agent Steve Lytel in Casablanca. Arrangements have been made to transport the girl Gabrielle Monet to the south of France and then to Casablanca, awaiting further instructions. Over. Bonjour. The roses will bloom early this year, I think. Oui, but uh, not too early, I hope. Good, good. I have been waiting for you. It is dark. I can't see you well. Is the girl with you? She is here. Gabby, say something so our friend will know you are here. I am tired. <laughs> Did you have difficulty reaching my safe in Paris? Uh, not too much. With swarms of displaced persons all over France to mingle with. And a slight bit of help along the way from the underground. It, it was not too bad. Good, good. Now follow me. I will take you to the fishing school. But I'm I know, so... I know you're tired. Cheer up, Gabby. You'll have a nice long trip by water to rest up. Oh. And then another nice long trip by auto to oh. Casablanca. Oh, I like automobiles. In the old days, I like nothing better than a, a pleasant ride. But Gabi did not like the automobile trip to Casablanca. It was probably nothing like the old days. I drove up front alone while she was fitted in the trunk of the car behind gasoline drums. <laughs> there were gunny sacks and a Moroccan rug thrown over her. Across everything, a heavy canvas cover lashed down with just enough air left for her to breathe. We drove that way over rough roads for several hours. When it got dark, I pulled over to a side lane and let her out. Oh. Gabby, come out, come out. Oh, oh, my back. It is broken. 
Oh. I, I will gladly um, massage it for you. Uh, you are too kind. Not at all. No, thank you. Ah, pity. Why did we stop? To give you a chance to uh, stretch your legs. And a cigarette, if oh. you want one. Oh, I would die for one. Give, 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 give. I have one lit here. Uh. Oh, mille merci. You see? I try to be gentle. Uh -huh. I try to make up for the inconvenience I am causing uh, you. Ah, ça c'est drôle. I remember what another poet once said. A German, by the way, but uh, not a Nazi. His name was Goethe. What did he say? He said, be gentle with women. Remember, they were made from a broken rib. <laughs> I am not amused. I'm sorry. You are always smiling. Do you enjoy the war, huh? I am a poet. There is poetic excitement in being behind the lines, working underground. I enjoy being a spy. Well, I am no matter Harry. You will do. You still have told me nothing. Why did they send for me? You remember a German named Paul Vogel? Paul... What do you know of him? Tell me. Not now. The time is late. But I must Throw know. Away your Why did you mention I his... said later. We have a long journey ahead. If we pass the border post, I will tell you. If we do not, <laughs> the words and minutes would only be wasted. Altula! I thought I would never reach the border. It's been a long trip. Where are you headed? Casablanca. Have you anything to declare? No, nothing. Let me see your passport. Here you are. All of a sudden, they spotted a small black dog sniffing and whining at the trunk of the car where Gabriel was hidden. The customs officer had not noticed him, and I knew I had to find some way to keep him from noticing. Ah! One becomes stiff after so long a ride. While he looked over my passport, I went to the rear of the car, picked up the dog by the scruff of the neck, and uh, started to pet him. Well, your, your passport seems to be in order, but what's the matter with Jeff? Oh, nothing. Perhaps he does not like to be picked up. <laughs> no. If he did, he wouldn't try to bite you. Better put him down. sniffing around that trunk. I felt like strangling that cute little black puppy. Well, put him down. I, uh, I have taken a fancy to him. Um, how do you feel about selling him to me, eh? Huh? Well, I... Uh, you, you, you are serious, monsieur? Oui, I like him. Come, come, how much, eh? Oh, take him. There are two more like him around somewhere. Uh, thank you. He will liven up the journey. Wait. Huh? Before you go... Yes. What is in your trunk? Huh? I said, what is in your trunk? Let me put the dog in the car, and then I will show you. The trunk, I will show you. You see? Gasoline drums. Yes, I see. Very well. Close the trunk. I may go? Of course. Thank you again for Joff. August 27th, 1942. Report to OSS headquarters in Washington from Agent Steve Lytell in Casablanca. Fontaine and the girl arrived. I knew as soon as she walked in that Paul Vogel could not have forgotten her. I only hoped her memories of him weren't too strong. Now, as you know, Miss Monet, this is an international zone. We are, in effect, neutrals. In Casablanca, we pass each other in the streets. Germans, Americans, Vichy, and Free French. You can imagine what a hotbed of international intrigue we have here. Oh, I, I know nothing of that kind of intrigue. Then perhaps we can broaden your horizon. Hold it, Henri. Now, listen to me, Yabby. The head of the German Armistice Commission in Casablanca is a man named Paul Vogel. Does that name mean anything to you? 
We knew each other once, before the war. Knew each other? He was an attaché to the German consulate in Paris. You almost married him once, isn't that so? That is my business. I'm afraid we've made it our business. Now, Gabby, we've kept close watch on you these past months, and we're sure that you're no Nazi or Vichy sympathizer. Oh, I hate them all for what they are doing to France. But Vogel, what are your feelings toward I, him? I, I haven't seen him in years. That's not answering my question. If he is a Nazi, I have no feelings toward him. All right, then. Now, the open secret here in North Africa is the planned American invasion. The closed secret is where and when. Now, that's what Paul Vogel wants to find out for German headquarters. Well, I still don't understand what I... You're I'm... to tell him, Cherie. What? Henri's right. You're to take up this friendship with him once more. What? Give him all the information he wants. You'll what? get it direct from us. What? Now, Give rest assured, it'll be the wrong information. You understand now? Uh, I'm beginning to. Good. We have a job for you at the Three Lanterns Cafe. Now, starting tomorrow... Agent Henri Fontaine and I were at the Three Lanterns Cafe the next night when Gabrielle opened there. The cafe was packed, but even the crowd around the bar, officers with ribbon chests, waterfront riffraff and black marketeers, all of them were quiet when she sang. She was wearing a red dress, and in the spotlight her face looked smaller and whiter, and her hair looked blacker. There wasn't a man in the room who could take his eyes off her. I wondered how soon it would be before Paul Vogel came in and saw her, too. Uh, a girl like that could make you forget the war, eh, Steve? I've got a wife back in Syracuse. <laughs> can she wear red like that? My wife can be trusted. And this girl? She and Vogel were pretty close in the old days. I know my own kind. She can be trusted. I hope you're right. The success of the whole American invasion may hinge on it. A lot depends on how hard Vogel falls for that little bait up there on the bandstand. Steve, hmm? Vogel, he's just come in. That's all I wanted to see. Come on, let's get out of here. Hey, excuse us, uh, pardon, pardon. This table is free, waiter. It will do. We uh, are oui, Vogel. You wish to see the wine list? Oh, I... That girl. How long has she been here? Uh, the singer, you mean? She started only tonight. Tell her to come to this table when she's finished. <laughs> you understand? We oui, I understand. No, you don't. You only think you do. Go tell her what I said. And bring a bottle of your best wine. Dear, it was you, Paul, when the waiter came to me. <laughs> How like you to walk back into my life so quietly after making so violent an exit. Ah, the world is small after all, Gabby. I'm amazed to find you in Casablanca. I can say the same of you. What are you doing here? I arrived here a few days ago, but I've been in North Africa for months. Tangier, Oran, Tunis, singing... How were you able to leave France yeah. after the occupation? You should know how well I always got along with Germans. Mm -hmm. You don't seem angry with me any longer, Liebchen. After that last time, six years ago... Uh, life is too short to be angry for too long at anyone. Mm -hmm. Besides, I was a fool to have been jealous over that silly blonde with the bad legs. I've even forgotten her name. Suzanne. Aha! Uh -huh. I see you have not forgotten. <laughs> oh, it's a wine. Gabby, how good it is to be with you again. How good it is to be with you, Paul. Ah, for you? For me. Now, we will drink to what is to be, Liebchen. Ah! 
You could have no better guide through Casablanca than I, Gubby. Come, what else would you like me to buy you from the marketplace? A scarf, perhaps? A gold scarf to put around your hair, yeah. Have you taken many girls to the marketplace, oh. huh? <laughs> Will you be forever jealous of me, Liebling? What is it, the French in you? Ah, it is the woman in me. <laughs> I imagine you are in great demand by the women here. The chief of the German Armistice Commission. How did you know that? I know more than you think. Oh? Would it interest you to know the name of one of the most important American agents in North Africa? Who? Steve Lytell. What do you know of him? I know him. And he knows the details of the planned American invasion. Come. I will buy you a gold scarf. Well, have you nothing to say of what I just told you? I knew that already. I, too, have agents. However, thank you for telling me. I can promise you more than a gold scarf if you find out additional information for me. Is this possible? It might be. Very possible. Agent Lytell in Casablanca to OSS in Washington. The girl, Gabrielle Monet, has been in the paid employ of the German government here for several weeks, according to our plan, and we'll transmit to them the Dakar Cover Project. September 1942. Report to OSS headquarters from Agent Monet. I had a feeling that things were going too smoothly. I seemed to be holding my breath, waiting for something to go wrong. And on the night of the 29th, it did. Paul Vogel was in my room above the cafe. We were listening to my record of our favorite song. You'll have to go soon. It is late. Forget the time. Who would think it would come to this again, Gabby? After that day in Paris, when we quarreled so. I remember that day. Mm. We showed poor judgment to argue out of doors. Mm. It was raining. <laughs> I got a terrible cold in the nose. Kiss that poor nose. Oh, Paul, you really must go. But before you do, I, I have a paper for you in my purse. Dates when high officials will be in Casablanca. Stay I'll get it moment. for you. I want to uh, talk to you. you. You're hurting my arm. Let Germany me go, Paul. is paying you well for this information know, you are giving Paul, us. I know, Paul, please. Some of it is useful uh, information, but none of it uh, is as important as I would like. I will try to do better. You had better do better. You know what would happen, Gabi. If I found out you were crossing me... I would not cross you. It is nothing oh, for me to my... twist your arm oh. like this. Such a small arm. Think what I could do if I really tried to hurt you. You hurt me now because you don't trust me. What do you want? You claim to know this American like that. I do. You claim you get your information from I him. Do. Is that all he gives you? What about his love? Oh. Does he give you that too? Paul... The shoe is on the other foot. Now it is you who are jealous. <laughs> oh, how foolish of you. Think. Would I lie to you? Gabby. Gabby. Oh, Gabby. If you ever lie to me, I... I would rather see you dead at my feet than standing, looking at me, and lying. You hear what I say? Yes. Yes, I hear. I hear. No more wine. 
I must keep my head clear to think of what you have just told me. Now are you satisfied that I'm earning my money? Mm-hmm. Dakar. So the Americans will land in a few weeks at Dakar. Very likely, very likely. Dakar is strategically important. It will be more important if the German fleet is there to stop the invasion. Yeah, yeah. That bungled attempt at a landing under de Gaulle's leadership failed, so the Americans probably figure we would not dream that they would try it again in the same place. (laughs) One American, Steve Lytell, does not dream you know all this. Hmm. Are you going to tell German headquarters? But of course, this is something they will want to know. He believes it, Steve. Every word of it. Good. The German fleet is being sent to stop the invasion at Dakar. Good, Gabby. Good work. Steve, radio report. Just in from Gibraltar. What is it? <laughs> no, 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 no. Let me tell it, Joff. General Clark will rendezvous on October 21st at Point Agreed near Algiers. You know what that means? Final preparations for the Iran invasion. Nothing must go wrong now. Nothing. November 4, 1942. Something very wrong happened. Paul came to my room just before I was ready to go downstairs to the cafe. Paul! Gabby, what? your friend Lytell has been playing you for a fool. Do you hear what I say? I don't understand. The invasion is not the car. I just learned myself it's to be Oran. Oran! And the German fleet, on my suggestion, is waiting in Dakar for oh, nothing. Paul. And will continue to wait Paul, for nothing. Paul, it can't be. Do you know be. what this will mean to me? Do you realize what the high command will do to me for please, this? Please, please, Paul. ruin. Perhaps, perhaps your latest information was wrong about Oran. No, 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 no. It all ties in. They, the Americans, wanted me to believe the... Gabi, what had you to do with this? Now what are you saying? I'm getting tired of your suspicions. One day you trust me, the next day you don't. You're French? What kind of French? Instead of questions, ask yourself this. Would I betray you, Paul? Not Germany, but you think. Look at me. Look at your Gabby and answer. I... I... No, of course not. Not you... You wouldn't dare. There may still be time to stop the Americans at Oran. I must get back to headquarters and let them know by radio. I should have done that right away instead of coming here. Oh, have a drink first. No, no, uh, later. I'll be back It later. will not be easy for you to tell the high command this. A drink will fortify you. Mm. <laughs> yes. Perhaps. Perhaps you're right. One drink, then. <laughs> sat on the edge of the couch, his head in his hands. I remember thinking how very blonde was his hair, how large his hands. It was not difficult for me to drop half the L tablet from my purse into his glass as I poured the liquor over it. Here you are. Poor Paul. Pauvre petit. You look so tired. Drink. Where are you going? To put on the record you like. We played it so often lately, Paul, that one of these days it will just rise up in protest. <laughs> You're tired? Uh, no. No, why should I be tired? I must go now. I've had my drink. Hear my record through, then you will go. No. No, now. I must go now. You're so good to me, Gabby. You love me. You love me very much. His head had fallen on his arms and rested on the table. The tablet had begun to work as I knew it would. I got the automatic pistol that had been given to me by the Americans and... shot him twice through his very blonde head. 
Mon amour, mon amour. Report mon amour, from Agent Gabriel mon amour, Monet. Mon amour, mon amour. Fini. Mon amour. Well, it ought to come any minute now. News of the invasion. I've had word that Eisenhower and Clark were in Gibraltar on November the 8th. I'll let you both know as soon as something comes through on the radio. Are you all right, Demi? <laughs> Me, don't concern yourself. You did what you had to do. It took courage. Well, if I had thought about it longer, perhaps I would not have had the courage. You cannot know. I think I do. He meant a great deal to me. A long time ago. I killed him. Listen to me. I told you something once that the poet Goethe said. He also said this. Give up what perished long ago... And let us love what's living. Do you hear, Gabby? Do you hear? Écoutez, écoutez. Yankee, Franklin, Midway, Lincoln, Robert, Harry. Oh, that's, that's the code name. Robert's arrived. The invasion's begun. Do you hear? Did you hear, Gabby? Did you? Yes. Yes. Yes, I heard. And once again, the report of an OSS agent is closed with the words... Mission accomplished. A further adventure in black warfare is next week's... Cloak and Dagger. Heard in today's story were Jane White, Barry Kruger, Leon Janney, Joseph Julian, Carl Weber, Raymond Edward Johnson, Guy Sorrell, and Bernie Gould. Script was by Winifred Wolfe. Music under the direction of John Gart. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This has been a Lewis G. Cowan production under the supervision and direction of Sherman Marks. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you have a true paranormal story that has happened to you or someone you know, you can share it by clicking on Tell Your Story at WeirdDarkness.com. I might use your story in a future episode. So is Bigfoot an interdimensional being? We continue looking into it. If you put together the vast number of sightings and the widespread nature of these reports, if any of it is to be remotely believed, 
then it's not difficult to get the impression that Bigfoot cannot really be classified as a super rare beast that lives in only the most remote, uninhabitable locales, and it subsequently gets more and more difficult to defend how they could have possibly gone without being discovered in any sense, especially in this modern age. Indeed, there has not ever been any definitive physical evidence of these creatures, despite all of these sightings. Sure, there are footprints and other signs of their activity such as rock piles, shelters, and so on, but as for blood, reliable hairs, a carcass, or even a fragment of a bone, there is none. Remember that these are creatures seen all throughout the United States and other places, often near highways and roads, yet there has never been a single trace of a body. It does seem rather odd that this should be the case with such a widely seen beast. Of course, if one is to ask a hardcore skeptic why any of this should be, you get a rather simple reply – that Bigfoot simply does not exist, man never has. Here is another notion – that it is an all-nation spanning urban legend that sprawls across cultures, and that it is all a tapestry of misidentifications, misinformation, hoaxes, and downright lies. Ask a skeptic, and they'll say that the reason there is no solid physical evidence of fossils is that Bigfoot has never existed in any form in the first place. However, we run into problems here as well. To outright dismiss or deny every single piece of evidence we do have out of hand, no matter how circumstantial, as well as the testimony of hundreds if not thousands of people is to suggest that this is one of the most complicated, elaborate hoaxes ever pulled off by mankind. While there are surely those who have fabricated sightings accounts or pulled hoaxes, can we say that every single person who has ever reported a Bigfoot is mistaken, a prankster, or worse yet, a liar? Are there so many people, often experienced or reliable witnesses known for their honesty, who would make up this stuff on such a large scale? What's more, are so many people out roaming around in the forest faking tracks and other signs of Bigfoot, often with rather compelling results, or cavorting about in gorilla costumes? In some ways, to suggest this is all some giant delusion and hoax is almost harder to accept than that there is a giant ape-like hominid wandering the wilds. So. If Bigfoot is seen by so many, yet leaves behind so little strong evidence, and still has remained undiscovered, and if these people are not all liars and delusional, then perhaps the explanation for Bigfoot lies somewhere else altogether. And this is where things get really weird. One admittedly controversial and outlandish idea that has nevertheless gained more and more momentum and traction in recent years is that rather than a flesh-and-blood animal that has simply remained undiscovered, we're perhaps dealing with an entity from some other reality or dimension, that instead of earthbound biological creatures, we're encountering interdimensional interlopers that shuffle back and forth across whatever membrane that separates our realms either by accident or design. This idea in general is not new to the world of the paranormal, Indeed, researcher and author John Keel, most famous for his book The Mothman Prophecies, he was well known for his speculation that some unexplained phenomena could possibly originate with what he termed ultra-terrestrials, or beings from a parallel dimension. Keel reasoned that their tentative nature in this reality and ability to shift between domains would help to explain some phenomena in which mysterious entities were widely seen, yet frustratingly unable to be concretely proven or cataloged. This could be applied to ghosts, aliens, demons, or even Bigfoot. An eminent UFO author and researcher, Jacques Vallée, often cited these ultra-terrestrials as being perhaps behind the UFO phenomenon, rather than nuts and bolts spaceships from some distant planet. The idea that Bigfoot could be interdimensional in origin would also go a long way towards explaining a variety of other anomalies that have proven to be inconvenient to the notion that we're dealing with a flesh-and-blood creature. The list of such strangeness connected to the Bigfoot phenomena is long. Reports of Bigfoot tracks that lead to nowhere, 
disappear in mid-stride or end at sheer walls of rock that such a creature could not possibly hope to climb are not uncommon. Many Bigfoot sightings possess a definite feel of the paranormal, such as accounts of the creatures vanishing into thin air or disappearing into flashes of light or shape-changing as well as invisible, vanishing, or telepathic Bigfoot. Then there are mysterious orbs of light or sudden inexplicable bright flashes that accompany many Bigfoot reports, details which are often downplayed or even omitted, as well as the numerous technical malfunctions that seem to plague those who would record the creatures, as well as their ability to generally avoid camera traps and other such electronic gear. On top of all of this, there are the numerous permutations of the creatures spotted all over the United States and elsewhere such as dogmen, goatmen, sheep squatch, bat squatch, werewolves, and lizard men, which open up a whole world of high strangeness that becomes more and more difficult to reconcile with any sort of flesh and blood animals this world of ours possesses. The idea that Bigfoot is an interdimensional entity might sound at first to be absurd, but considering all of the boxes this potential explanation ticks, is it really? Is it really so far-fetched if one's to accept that Bigfoot is real in any form? Indeed, such ideas are being pursued more and more to explain a wide variety of what has traditionally been seen as paranormal phenomena, and even in mainstream science our understanding of physics and the universe has increasingly opened up the possibility that other universes exist beside our own, even bleeding over into ours. Such an interdimensional link is being seen more and more plausible as both a scientific theory and as a possible thread that runs through it all. One paranormal researcher named William Hall has said of this, it used to be that the UFO people didn't talk to ghost people because they were a little weird, and nobody would talk to the Bigfoot people because they were crazy. I found out we cannot continue to do that. In reality, quantum physics is leading us there. So is Bigfoot an interdimensional being? We'll talk more about that coming up on Weird Darkness. Anywhere and anything can be haunted and many people from all walks of life experience strange things in surprising locations. As you will discover, the prettiest of places, the most innocent of places, and the most unexpected places can still be filled with supernatural forces and pure demonic malevolence. Haunted places, churches, hospitals, forests, the workplace, and more horrifying true tales of ghosts, demons, poltergeists, and the paranormal. Come and be chilled by people's creepy experiences with the supernatural in ordinary, everyday places. Warning: Listening to this audiobook may increase nervousness. True Tales of Haunted Places by G. Michael Vasey Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar You're a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Manufacturers of State Express 3.5 Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting The Creaking Door. Interesting people. 
including our creaking door attorneys, Messrs. Shaken, white-lipped, and trembling. And it's no secret how they got that way. <laughs> in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. Mr. Charter, sir. Thanks. You all ready? All ready, sir. This way, the governor's waiting for you. I know my way. Yeah, and you ought to know, sir, seeing as how you've been here so often. You may like to know he ate a good breakfast. Oh, the prisoner. That's right. Resigned, he seems. You don't have to come with me. Sorry, sir, it's regulation. A warder must accompany the hangman at all times. It's really so that you don't get attacked, sir. You right. see, some of the prisoners are getting a bit angry. Very popular, our remorse is, Mr. Charter. Very popular among the villains. Well, here you are, Governor's office. Come in. Good morning, Major Wills. Morning, Charteris. You're late. Uh, there was fog in town. Don't tell me that, kept you. No, perhaps not. Or are you like the rest of us? Scared. I've never been too scared to do my duty. The men think he's innocent. Ah, Major Wills, they aren't men. You aren't in the army now. They're prisoners. He's a murderer. He was found guilty by a jury of his peers. But he probably sentenced to death. The trouble is, I think Morse is innocent. Don't you? With respect. He's in our province, sir. You're the prison governor, and I'm the hangman. Respective parts are very simple. Got to play them properly. Now, if, uh, if you excuse me, sir, I see that all's well in the execution chamber. I'll see you there, Governor. You have to sign the warrant before I can act, remember? Yes, I'll be there. Much as I hate the idea of hanging an innocent man, our duty is plain. Yes, I shall be there. like for you, and uh, I'm sorry. No. Nobody knows what it's like. It's lonely, my friend. Lonelier than outer space. Only one way to look at it. We all got to go sometime. You might have been spared worse than that, hanging. Spared worse? Would it make you feel any better to confess? Usually does, they say. And it's customary. Confess? Confess to a murder I didn't do. I didn't kill Judge Peters. I wasn't near the house. 
I was called out by the man I told them about, the tall man. He kept me busy while they... They did what had to be done. I was framed, I tell you. Well, it's your business. But the gun was yours and it had your prints on it. You're known as a criminal. The judge had given you five years of hard labor. And you thought he'd no right to do it. You escaped from jail, man. How could you be innocent? No, it doesn't matter. It's too late now. Yes, it is too late. How long have I got? Mm, ten minutes. Brace up, Morse. You're a popular man, and since the days of the old highwaymen, popular villains always made a good end. Yes, we'll all remember you, Morse. Don't worry about that. We'll all remember you. Major Wills. Charters. What well, no wrong, man? What's wrong? I can't go through with it, that's all. I can't. Put yourself together. I've seen the sign. Sign, I tell you. There in the execution shed. No, no, I can't go through with it. The chap's innocent. You uh, speak of a sign. What sign? Oh, uh, when, when I opened the door of the execution shed, he was there. Morse. Standing on a trap with a gallows. A rope round his neck. It couldn't have been Morse. Uh, Morse is in the condemned cell and you know it. And he's alive, so it could hardly have been his ghost. I'll tell you. I'll tell you, I see Put yourself together. You're suffering from nerves, that's all. Me? Me suffering from nerves? Not in your life. Remember what happened to your father? Yeah. My father was the best hangman this country ever had. Well, he killed himself, all right, very well. Lots of us go that way. You see, a man's sort of different when he's alone. That's when they come. When they stand round with their heads bent. The ones you turned off. When the daylight comes, it's different. They just vanish away. Whoever heard of a haunted execution shed? Why, the idea is nonsense. That's exactly what I've been well, telling I you, think... man. Hang it all, Charters. You you can't expect me to ring up the Home Secretary and, and get him to postpone an execution because you started seeing I things. I was standing on the trap with a rope round his neck. The hood was over his head. He raised the hand to me. Stop. It's like a cop on point duty. Excuse me, sir. Is the execution postponed? No, of course not. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, it is. Because, beg your pardon, sir, that poor fellow waiting in the death cell. The convicts are starting to get out of hand. You know what it's like when there's an execution. They're all on edge. Morse is a very popular man. Yeah, I'll talk to Morse, then to the men. In charge of this, you stay here and try to screw up enough courage to do your job. Water Bates, examine the execution shed and tell me what you discover. We'll meet here in ten minutes. Describe as a technical hitch. I'm very sorry that your ordeal should be dragged out. Uh, the, the matter's beyond my control. I, I understand. But I can hold out no hope of any kind. You're aware of that. As soon as arrangements can be made. I know. I understand. What's that noise? Uh, the convicts are demonstrating. They know I'm innocent. They're greatly affected by any execution. When one is delayed, well, they tend to break down. They know I'm innocent. So do you. I have not studied your case, Morse. It's none of my business. You were properly found guilty by a jury of your peers. That's all that concerns me. You were sentenced to death, and jail delivery was effected at my prison. I didn't kill Judge Peters. A tall man lured me away from home that night. <laughs> but there's no use talking to you. It's not your fault, I know that. Mm. There was a single fact you could remember about this man. Or if you could explain away one bit of the evidence. Now, now listen. No. That's it, you see. I've been cleverly framed. Nothing's been left to chance. The torch have got me out of my house and away from home. Then I had no alibi. That was when they killed the judge. Morse, what can you remember about this man? Think. Think hard. Nothing. I remember nothing. What did he say? He said my brother was in trouble, that he'd been arrested. He said his name was Lippy. That's all, just Lippy. He said I had to sign for my brother's bail. 
Every thief caught with the goods on him always says a tall man handed them over, or a short man, or a fat man, never a man who can be identified. Try, Morse. You're standing in the very shadow of death. You never can help you. But somehow I've always believed your story. There's nothing that can be done. Oh, try, man, try. What kind of a voice had this tall man? Voice? <laughs> like a crook. Like an old lag. Talk from one corner of his mouth without moving his lips, you know. It's hopeless, isn't it? Yes, I know that. Nothing short of supernatural aid could save me now. And there's no hope of that. Isn't there, I wonder? Examine the execution shed, sir. There's nothing there. Nothing at all. I don't believe it. You're lying, Bates. I'm not used to being called a liar, even by a hangman. He's lost his nerve. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I've well, seen that's it. Enough. I've that's seen it. That's enough, both of you. I'm going to report a small technical hitch in the execution. Yeah. Bates, take Charteris here to the execution shed and demonstrate there are no spooks or bogeys in it. Yeah. Then test the gallows with a bag of sand the same weight as the prisoner. The execution will take place immediately afterwards. Got it? Yes, sir. Right, go to it. There. Perfect. Want me to try it again? No, no. It worked. They, they know he's not guilty. Straighten your spine, you sniveling rat. All right. All right, I think. I'm going to get this over with before the men have breakfast. And if you won't pull the lever, I'll do it myself. Nothing. You've received spiritual aid. Yes. The sentence of death must now be carried out as for the sentence of the court. The trap won't work. It won't work. We can't hang him now. We can't. in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new, smooth, State Express 3.5s today. Yes, sir. 
Go mix the kicker up or else, still. They keep the doors closed. You ask me, we'll have a full-size riot on our hands if we try and hang Morse again. The sentence of the court is clear. Mm. As for the, the fiction that an execution cannot be attempted twice, that's utter rubbish. We must simply persevere, that's all. Well, do it yourself. I can't. Very well, Charters. I shall. Well, first, be so good as to help us with that bag of sand. We'll go and test the trap again. <laughs> There. Now, pull the lever. Now, there's nothing wrong with the mechanism. There's a great deal of matter outside. They come to me, Bates. Will you open the door? All right, you may. There's no cause for alarm, men. I want silence here. Any prisoner continuing in this fashion will be severely punished. Shall I sound the alarm and arm my men, sir? Uh, not yet, Bates. Poor devils, I can't blame them. The hangman's got the jitters and none of us believe Morse is guilty. I'm going to telephone the Home Secretary and ask for a stay of execution. <laughs> Until the morning, Bates. We have a stay of execution until the morning. I'm ordered to have the gallows working or, or resign. The scandal will shake the entire country. He should be reprieved. He's been through enough. Yes, Bates, but the law is the law. There's nothing we can do. Unless we can show clearly that Moss was not guilty of the judge's murder. Not much chance of that, sir. No. And yet, I wonder... You remember the circumstances of the case, don't you? Not very clearly, sir. I followed it at the time, but so far as I can remember, the evidence was clear. Mm. Morse claimed he'd been wrongly convicted of a robbery. Found guilty and sentenced to five years hard labor. Mm. Peters was an hanging judge. He was a man who liked Parsons, sentenced to death. Yes, he kept Charteris busy, Judge Peters did. Morse escaped from prison. And the judge was found shot. And Morse, when he was arrested, could only produce a weak story about a tall man who lured him away from the house. The rest of the evidence was conclusive. I must say, it seems so to me, sir. Bates, if we could find that man... Plenty of people added him for Judge Peters. He sent Manor into the gallows and young Eddie Chance. Eddie never deserved to die. It was manslaughter, pure and simple. Bates, that's your opinion. You didn't hear the case. Like animals, just like animals behind bars. I must act soon if they don't stop it. They refused dinner, threw the food about... By the way, where's Chatteris? He's in the duty room, sir. Well, I want to talk to him. He's still raving about this ghost or apparition or whatever it was he saw. Very well, I'll see him there. In the meantime, try to get some sense into the prisoners. This isn't helping anybody. Tell me, is it direct mob action or do they seem to have a leader? Cockney Harry, a lifer. He leads most of the trouble around here. Pallet Morsey, sir, he escaped with him. Mm. Bring him to my office under guard. Yes, sir. Shall I charge him with a breach of regulations? I want to talk to him first. If he knows Moss, well, he might be able to help. Well, I'd better go and see Charteris. Charteris? I'll tell you I saw it. Standing there in the execution shed, the ghost of a ghost. You have a drink? Take it easy, man. Why didn't the trap work? Show me that, then. How do I know? Perhaps the wood had warped or something. I've inspected it. There's no warp. Put a sack on the trap. Crash, it works. Put moss on it. It don't work. Why? Forces. Supernatural forces, Major Wills. An apparition. No apparition. The execution will okay. take place tomorrow morning at eight. There must be no slip. You just get a new hangman. You haven't seen him the way I did. You haven't seen him standing around you in the dark? Just a glimmer of the lamps outside the house. Look, it 
Just as I looked. Just as I looked. Hold yourself together, Just Chartres. Just as I looked. Uh, pull yourself together. You'll drive yourself out of your mind. Uh, I'll get away my day, Wade. He tied her rope himself. He never did a better job. He calculated the drop exactly to the inch. He just stepped off. It's famous, Major. I ought to know. Stop drinking and stop that gibbering, or I'll have you locked in a cell. Uh, excuse me, sir. Garrett's in your office. Uh, Garrett? Oh, yes. Cockney Harry. Yeah, I'm coming in a moment. He's a tall man, Garrett, yeah. He's a very tall man, isn't he? What do you mean? I just said he was tall. Only one thing you can do to help the situation, Chartres. Sober up. Fine, Governor. You know the penalty for acting against authority? Yes. Yeah. I've got to stand in the corner and get kept in after me sewing class. Mm. Morse is a pal of yours, isn't he? What if he is? You don't like what happened this morning, do you? Makes a change, Governor. This is going to leak out, you know. You can't stop it. Oh, what a jail. The hangman's drunk and the gallows won't work and you're going to try it on the poor devil again tomorrow. The law will take its course and justice will prevail. God, chase my Aunt Fanny round the exercise yard. You smug, bloated, frog-faced son of a... Kill the civil tongue of your... Leave him, Bates. Leave him. Let him blow off steam. You're a fair man. Well, everybody says so. Until now, I reckoned you were decent. But a screw. But you've got no hope, have you? You can't hang, Morse. Go on, try. Get creepy charter is sober and let him have another go. You'll go down in history as the man who couldn't hang Morse. There, you'll see. What were you doing in the execution shed today? Ah, just a morbid interest in such things. I had an old uncle once. You admit being in the shed. Uh, it was you whom charter saw. I don't admit nothing. Why did you shoot the judge? Me shoot him? Yes, you. You escaped and took Morse with you, not the other way about. Why did you escape, Garrett? Cloistrophobia. I had a girlfriend once who couldn't even stay in a room with the door shut. <laughs> and not with me, she couldn't. You uh, killed Judge Peters. Why, man? Me kill him? Oh, don't make me laugh. I'm the only bloke with a perfect alibi. And my alibi is Morse. That's who Morse himself. And you were the tall man he met that night. Uh, an unfortunate slip of the tongue, wasn't it, Harry? Bates, bring Morse here. We'll save that man whether he likes it or not. Morse, I want the truth. Yes, Morse. Tell him or you're going to get into trouble. Shut up, Harry. Morse, was this the tall man who lured you away from the house that night? Yeah, I've admitted it, boy. It's okay, you can tell him. Yes. Harry asked me to meet him to discuss getting out of the country. He said there was a ship. Yeah, so there was. There you are. I was outside the house with Morse at the time. Now do you believe I didn't kill Judge Peters? We'll see Chartres in the execution room. All of us, now. Let me inform you, I'm a man in a respectable and important government position. I'm not a bit tribal with. And let me tell you this. If I can't hang Morse, nobody can hang him. Morse, I'll see you at eight sharp tomorrow, my lad. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Stay where you are, Jarvis. Have you ever heard of a case before in which a convicted prisoner couldn't be hanged? Uh, lots of them. My colleagues usually won out, you know. Crime doesn't pay, eh, boss? It seems incredible to me, Charters, that a man in your profession hasn't heard of the most famous case of all. The original case of the man they couldn't hang. What are you getting at, Major? Did you plan the escape, Chartres? What? Did you get Morse out of jail in order to give you a perfect setup for murder? Did you frame Morse and betray him? What an idea. And in the end, you found you couldn't go through with it, didn't you, Chartres? I don't say anything you can't prove. You found you couldn't hang Morse in the end, and so you told us the tall story about the ghost in the execution shed and the trap that wouldn't work. Well, you saw it work with a sack of sand, didn't But you? you weren't standing in place, were you, Chartres? Huh? You see, I read that story, too. The man they couldn't hang. And I guarantee that when you stand in place, there's a plank that slides out under the trap and stops it working. Uh, I had to kill the judge. I had to. But why? That's what I can't understand. Why? Because he killed my father. Drove him off his head. Men, my dad wreck was innocent. They had to go. It's the same with me. I've been off my head with it. The hanging judge, they called him. But he didn't have to do the hanging. I did. I did not. Major. Major. When it comes to me, 
my church. Please let my assistant turn me off. Young Sammy. He's got a touch, Sammy's. He's an artist. Couldn't be succeeded by a better man. Interesting lives some people lead, don't you think? And as for poor Charteris, the executioner, he keeps us in fits of laughter with his merry jets. Here, behind the creaking door. in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door, of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3.5 Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... Creaking door. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marler. It's full of the strange and macabre, as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marler on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marler. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. We're talking about Bigfoot and how there's no evidence for him, but maybe that's because he's not a physical animal, but something interdimensional. And there is a lot of controversy over the theory. It's meaningless to postulate at this point as to how or why these entities might do this. We wouldn't even know where to begin at this point. However, considering that this theoretical interdimensional travel by these beings could possibly be explained by science as we know it, none of this would even be technically paranormal at all, but rather an effect of natural phenomena that we simply just don't understand yet. In this sense, such interdimensional interlopers would not be supernatural in any sense, just utilizing features of laws of the universe that simply lie beyond our understanding at this point. Paranormal researcher Rob Riggs he gave his spin on this on the podcast After Dark. He said, We always want to jump right in and say that's extra-dimensional or paranormal, but you know, I think we may simply be talking about creatures that have access to physical spaces that humans cannot perceive. 
that they in fact are three-dimensional physical creatures, but they're able to go into spaces that lie outside our perception because they are outside our reality tunnel. That somehow these creatures enter into spaces that we have not mentally tuned into. Nevertheless, the interdimensional Bigfoot theory is at this point still very controversial among cryptozoologists, many of whom cling to their flesh and blood explanation, tooth and nail, and consider any other explanation woo-woo and an affront to their field. To even mention such an idea on some Bigfoot forums or at Bigfoot conventions will get you the cold shoulder at best, and laughed out of the room at worst, and it's actually rather shocking at times how close-minded some in the field can be with any theory that doesn't quite see eye-to-eye with what they think. In many respects, these cryptozoologists are every bit as dismissive of the interdimensional theory as skeptics are of the idea of Bigfoot to begin with, which could actually be hindering finding out any answers either way, as it forces us into close-minded, preconceived avenues of inquiry and creates divides between different camps, who are all at least ostensibly searching for the truth. One cryptozoologist named James R. Harnock had explained this attitude towards interdimensional explanations within cryptozoology. While many cryptozoologists and cryptozoology supporters find such theories ridiculous and often laugh them off, we would all do well to remember that the so-called mainstream of science has much the same reaction when presented with the possibility of Sasquatch existing at all. If we hope for mainstream scientists to keep an open mind, we must lead by example and not waste time and energy. That would be better spent searching for evidence, fighting amongst ourselves. Of course, not all cryptozoologists are so resistant to the idea, and there has even been the idea that flesh-and-blood cryptids, such as Bigfoot, can coexist with theories of more interdimensional entities, that they are not mutually exclusive. For instance, there could very well be biological hairy hominids in some areas of the world and perhaps even a flesh-and-blood Bigfoot in some areas, but that those creatures are also joined in their habitat by other, more mysterious entities from another reality. There's not necessarily a need to favor one over the other, and famed cryptozoologist Lauren Coleman has said of this, quote, "...so as not to come off as a hypocrite, I must point out that I have investigated and written about winged humanoids, dogman werewolves, goat men, lizard men, mermaids, and a myriad of other non-human entities. If they exist, these apparitions are most certainly paranormal in nature. Interdimensional, extraterrestrial, demonic, choose your own wording. The difference with Bigfoot slash Sasquatch is that it's clearly represented in our fossil history in the form of robust hominids from the Pleistocene. That makes its existence very viable in the natural world. I respect everyone's right to their opinion and don't make a habit of questioning anyone's personal experiences. If you believe you've seen a Bigfoot materialize or vanish, it may very well be that there is a supernatural phenomenon that chooses to take the form of a giant hairy humanoid, seemingly related to Bigfoot but only superficially similar." Unquote. Maybe this is true, and we're dealing with a spectrum of disparate phenomena that ranges from real flesh-and-blood animals to other more paranormal or woo-woo explanations. Perhaps the answers lie somewhere in between these different ideas, depending on the case. But it seems the full truth will possibly elude us if we're not willing to at least admit that there are certain holes in the theory of these creatures as solely undiscovered animals that have not been satisfactorily proven, and hold firmly to the flesh-and-blood hypothesis in every single case. I don't mean to particularly endorse the idea of an interdimensional Bigfoot here, nor to even say that a flesh-and-blood Bigfoot is impossible. Yet this does not cover the full range of the phenomenon at large. I only mean to suggest that, in the light of the various anomalies and oddities that can be seen across the full spectrum of the Bigfoot phenomenon, which are often inconsistent with a normal animal as we know it, perhaps we need to at least consider other possibilities, no matter how outlandish or even absurd they might seem at first. Maybe we need to think outside the box, to seek fresh avenues to pursue in order to shine new light into the darkness of the unknown and illuminate beyond the edges of what we can now see. In the considerable morass of all the ideas and theories swirling about on Bigfoot, in the end it can be basically distilled into a few choices. We can either believe sightings, reports, and the evidence so far have merit, and thus accept that Bigfoot perhaps really exists, 
or we can dismiss it all as a grand elaborate hoax. If we are to take the former, then we can choose to deal with it as strictly a biological animal as we uncomfortably struggle with the growing improbability of it going undiscovered so long in every state of the Union and places where it should not be without a shred of concrete evidence. In that case, we must also accept all sightings reports as being potentially real, including ones that have uncomfortable paranormal tones, which can be hard to reconcile with an animal as we know it, and so must wrestle with this conundrum. Or we can concede that at least some of it is something perhaps weirder than we'd like to admit, whether this is interdimensional phenomena or something else. Maybe we have to consider for a moment that the Bigfoot phenomenon might be stranger than we imagine, perhaps even stranger than we can imagine. Haunted by a shadowy spirit creature, which they say lives inside their home, a Gasparilla family is now seeking spiritual help to remove their unwanted guest. Krishna Mathura of Hilltop Drive, Gasparilla, a town in southern Trinidad, says over the past seven months a three-foot-tall spirit-like creature believed to be a buck has been roaming his home. The house is perched on an incline overlooking the central range. It is fenced, and Mathura says the supernatural occurrences have been causing them sleepless nights. According to Caribbean folklore, the buck has ties with both Guyanese and African folklore. They're believed to have originated in West Africa, where the short races, the pygmies, were believed to have magical powers. They were referred to as Baku, which in many West African languages means little brother or short man. There are also stories of rich Trinidadians who came upon their wealth not through hard work but rather through a trip to the forests of Guyana to capture one of these little wish-granters. The bucks usually live in dark places like addicts and usually demand blood and milk. During an exclusive interview with Guardian Media at the family's home recently, Mathura said his wife Balmati and son Govinda began hearing a voice inside the house. The house was telling Balmati that he wanted sex. Mathura, who retired from his workplace recently, said it was only when he started staying home that he realized what his family was going through. The creature, Mathura claimed, has also been eating valuable racing pigeons that he rears behind his home. Their goats have also been poisoned and sausages, meat, and other items eaten from his fridge. Balmati claimed the creature appears and vanishes before their eyes. She said that she was in the living room when the tablecloth flew up and went flying out the window. Govinda was also there. They chased after it and Balmetti said it dropped in some bushes and then disappeared. This is not the only item that has vanished. Govinda said an expensive vase and a picture of Jesus Christ also went missing, along with their Bible. Playing a recording of a voice he claimed belonged to the buck, Govinda said the creature admitted to stealing the Bible and the picture to take to his boss. If there's one thing I won't do is lie to you. I carry it by the boss and he tell me to bring it back before I get in trouble," the voice on the audio drawled. In another recording, the voice said that he came from Jamaica. "'I don't fray pundit ramish, and I don't fray no pastor,' the voice said. A deep-throated laugh and the mewing of a cat were also recorded as evidence of this spirit creature. Govinda said the voices were recorded at night. Govinda used clay and created a horned idol to ward away the buck, but Mathura said that has not worked. We tried everything. We burn incense, gugul, sprinkle salt, garlic, red lavender. We called the pundit and the pastor. They told us it's a buck. This thing is distressing us. We cannot sleep. Every night we hearing banging. It loves to wake us up. Every time we can hear it through the cracks in the house saying, oi, he added. Govinda said the buck is a short, fat man with a fat face, big hair, and big ears. He doesn't walk on his foot. He walks on his toes. His left hand is on his right side, and his right hand is on his left. He does cuss me. A few days ago, he came with a match to burn down my father's car. Most times, he's invisible, but I could hear his voice. He follows us, Govinda says. Pastor Dina Romnerine from the Christ Crusaders Assembly in Whiteland confirmed to the TNT Guardian that she had visited the family and said that she believed they were facing a demonic attack. When I visited them, it was almost night, and I prayed with them, and they said they slept very well. 
I told them that they have to pray and believe in God, Ramnarine said. Asked whether she believed it was a buck, Ramnarine said yes. I have encountered things like that, she said, because I work in the interior of Guyana. I've seen a buck in Guyana, so I believe in them. We cannot be afraid of it. We have to take authority and the Lord delivers. The buck will usually beat up the house. Whistle at them. You'll see flying things all over the room. It'll take time for it to leave, but they have to stop playing with it by talking about it and talking to it. Just ignore it and call to Jesus for deliverance. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Good evening. This is Peter Lawrence. Man kills passionately out of hunger or anger, out of fear or love. But man also destroys life coldly and impersonally, without rancor, unemotionally and with but one purpose, to gain. It is of greed and murder that you hear tonight in a mystery playhouse. <laughs> and unregenerate of human beings. And conscience is an unseen but terrible demon to those whose hearts are set in evil, exerting a grim and unrelenting power over their minds. Tonight our story concerns itself with a price of greed and revolves about a strange and almost fateful phenomenon that forced a man to stand ghastly trial before a jury of the dead. Listen as we tell you of Captain Boo Harrison and the six who did not die. below the equator, where the blinding sun beats with fierce hatred on the endless surface of the sea, lie the lonely islands of the Gambier Archipelago. There is no movement in the white, hot expanse of sand and ocean, no movement save the brief, fluttering excursions of flying fish and the few palm fronds that wave languidly above precarious footholds in the scanty soil. Barren and lonely are the Gambiers. And lonelier than most is the atoll of Mangareva, a strip of sand and gray coral rising from the sea like something foul and festering. For at high water, the tide sweeps over it, and retreating leaves on its sloping beach all manner of snails and shellfish that helpless broil and putrefy under the blazing sun. 
No trader has ever visited Mangareva, for there is no one with whom to trade. And the gunboats of the Australian Territorial Patrol give it wide berth, for there is no one to watch. Only an occasional pearling vessel with its crew of native divers ventures within sight of Mangareva. Such a vessel is the sloop Nancy Hale, four days out of Sydney. A weather-beaten hulk with caulking oozing from her open seams, she lies at anchor in the lee of the island. It is sundown, and her small boat is returning from a day of pearl diving. The oars stroked by six dark-skinned natives, the cockney mate standing in the bow. As the boat swings broadside to the sloop, the mate clambers aboard. All right, Kamali. Make her fast to the stern cleat. And mind you don't lose one of those oars overside. Me, not ten. Now it is ten. Me do same work all time. Oh, oh, blimey, stop your even babbling. I don't care whose turn it is. Make her fast to the ship them oars. If it ain't done by the time I get back from seeing the captain, I'll take the eyes off you. Now you mind what I say. Oh, those beggars always getting their ends up about something. Ain't one thing, it's another. I give ten pounds right here and now to be lifting a pint down in the Red Dragon Call, blimey, I would, instead of sweating me blood out in a, a million miles from civilization. Aye, Captain. Well, I could not leave three sheets in the wind. I'll take a look. Who's there? Now keep your shirt on, bull. It's nobody but me, Foggy. Oh, Back already? Well, it's been ten hours under that blasted sun. Ain't that enough? Close the door. How'd you make out? Eh, not bad. Well, <coughs> uh, you might invite a chap to have a nip of that there gin sitting on the table. Go ahead. That's the last of it. Well, oh, blimey, the last of 60 bottles we took on at Sydney. <laughs> you ain't been bashful about drinking it, have you? You got any objections? Oh, no, no, don't be getting your end up, Bull. No offense. Why are you drinking? Let's see what you got for your ten hours. Well, no, I think we've done pretty fair at that. Here's one in your eye. Ah, ha, <laughs> uh, ha. Nothing like a spot of Dutch gin to set a chat right. Well, oh, good at that. Too bad there ain't more of it for the old back to Sydney. What makes you think we're hauling back? I think we are, Mr. Addison. Fast as the old trouble takers. I think we are. Come on out with it. What'd you get? A handful of stinking seed pearls? Seed pearls? Is it not on your life? Give an eye to these, if you please. Good Lord. Not bad, eh, Mr. Addison? Where'd you get these, Foggy? Fifty yards southeast of Mangareva in two fathoms of water. You know what they're worth? God, they must weigh fifty grains apiece. How many are there? One, two, three, four, Eight five. Eight by my eight. count. That's right. Eight times fifty. Four hundred grains. Mm, all perfect, too. Hardly need peeling. There's a thousand pounds here, Foggy. Maybe more the way the market is today. By heaven, you're right. We are hauling back. I can do a lot with a thousand pounds. <coughs> Ain't you forgetting something, Captain? As about me and the natives. What do you mean? Well, the natives get half the catch according to the agreement with their chief, and I get ten percent. Well, figuring rapid and not intending to be accurate, I should say that leaves you four hundred pounds, not a thousand. <laughs> Trouble with you, Foggy, is you don't know how to figure. Now, listen... When we took on this batch of divers, we never dreamed we'd run into a hall like this, did we? Can't say as we did. All right. We figured maybe we'd come back with 50 or 100 grains, not 400. What are you leading up to? How far can I trust you, Foggy? Well, now, I'd say that all depends on how much it's worth to be trusted. If we get what I think we should for those eight beauties... Your cut will be 300 pounds, $1,500. Go, blimey, enough to take me back to England in style, ain't it? More than enough. Well, it sounds most attractive. Uh, how do you plan to work it? Right now, eight people know about this catch. You and me and the six divers. Chances are there are plenty more pearls where these came from. Must be a natural bed. We got to fix it so only you and me know the location of that bed. Savvy? I ain't interested in the bed. All I'm thinking about is getting enough to ship back to England. Okay, this is how to get it. You still ain't giving me no details like it, if you understand what I mean. There's nothing to it. We lay over here tonight. Tomorrow morning, we tell the boys we're making one last dive and hauling back. I'll go along with you in the small boat so I can mark the spot. I'll take a belaying pin with me. 
They'll all dive in pronto because they've been there before. And when they come up one at a time like they always do... Wham! You get me, Foggy? I get you, Bull. To it, eat to it. We ain't going to no tea party. You say no more dive. You say we go back. Oh, Mind your babbling tongues, you even. We got the captain with us today. He wants to see how you dive. Ain't that right, Miss Addison? That's right, boys. This is the last dive, and then we haul back. Good catch this trip. Plenty gin. For the likes of them, as he's left to drink it. Shut up, you fool. We make only one dive, then we go back. How about that, Miss Addison? Yeah, one dive. Then you're through. Yeah, they like that. They're poor beggars. What in your lip, Foggy, and tender business? We were southeast of Manga River, about 50 yards off. This is the spot. Close enough, I'd say. Shippers! Eat that anchor, Taro. Over with it. Sure, this is the spot, Foggy. As near as I can come to it. She holding, Taru? Yes, she holds. All right, let her swing with the tide. What there is of it? Water slack. Okay, get him over, Foggy. Here we go, boys. You first, Kamuli. Me, no dive. Me, ear hurt. He's got a dive. Here, let's have a look at your ear. No, can see. Hurt deep inside. Why'd you say something about it before we left the sloop? Wait a minute, Foggy. I'll handle this. Come, Ollie. Ear hurt bad, Captain. Very bad. One dive won't do it no harm. I come out here special to see you and your boys go down. Tell you what I'll do. Anything you bring up this dive belongs to you. No split. All pearls yours. How's that? Well, what about it, Kamali? No dive. Stand up in the boat. Stand up, I said. Now, for the last time, Kamali, you're going to dive or not? No, no dive. You hurt the bad. Well, maybe this will cure it. Well, the rest of you get over and make it fast. Go ahead. Oh, there he was. Oh, oh, oh. Ah, that does it. They're over. Hold the boat steady, Foggy. I'll work the belay and finish. They come up. What about this one, you slug? Leave him be till we get rid of the rest. Hold steady now. They won't be staying down there long, I can promise you. I got a funny feeling no good's going to come of this. Throw your feelings and keep the boat steady. That's all you've got to do. I'll take care of the rest. One little tap of this belay and finish. They come up will be enough. Here comes one. Right aside the boat. Steady. Steady. Mm. Ah, that does for him. Went down like a rock. Two more coming up. I see him. Ah, that may spring. See the others? Not yet. Water got roughed up, am I? Hold on. Here they come. Two together. That'll make it easy. Steady now. <coughs> Blimey, did you see the way them two's eyes rolled up? <sighs> like the sinner shivers through me. Give me a hand with this one and sew the gab. What you gonna do with it? Keep him over. Wait till I tap his skull to make sure he don't come to. <clears throat> there ain't nothing finicky about you, is there, Bull? Grab his feet. <clears throat> Lift him now. <clears throat> You're all right. Here. <clears throat> ah, now, get that anchor up. The job's done. All neat and clean. It ain't done for me. I'll be seeing them poor beggars' eyes rolling up for a long time to come. You'll forget about it once we hit Sydney. There'll be plenty of gin and rooms in the best hotel in town. All I want is to book passage on the first boat back to England. Don't worry about that, Foggy. You'll go back to England a rich man. I got another idea. The money we get for those pearls is going to be nothing compared to what we end up with. Now what's on your mind? You'll find out. Get that anchor up. All set? Right. Bend two on the oars. We're gonna be rich men, Foggy, you and me. Plenty rich. Well, 
twelve hundred pounds you got for them pearls, and me supposed to get my share, and I ain't seen a shilling, and I'm not going to now. Shut up and open the door. You got the key? No, I ain't got nothing. Nothing for killing six men. Right down, you stupid fool. Like to get us hanged? Here's the key. Open the door. We're going to be rich men, Foggy, you and me. How's about that, Mr. Harrison? Open the door, I said. Twelve hundred pounds, and now we ain't got nothing. Close the door. Twelve hundred pounds lost. Stop talking about it. I've heard all I want to hear. Oh, you have? It don't bother you that I ain't got no passage money, does it? You think I figured on losing it? I had a system to beat that roulette wheel. Something happened. Didn't work. I told you to stop. You told me. What do you know about it? All I was trying to do was to build that stake up, make us some real money. Yeah, now we ain't got nothing. Gamble it away, you did. There's more where that came from. I've got 20 pounds left. Enough to pay for this hotel room, dock charges on the sloop and provisions. We'll go back to Mangareva and get ourselves some more of them big pearls. I ain't going nowhere near Mangareva. Not on your life, I ain't. Why not? Because it ain't got pleasant memories, that's why. I'm quitting. I know a rum deal when I see one. Ah. Twelve hundred pounds left in a gambling house. So you're quitting, huh? What makes you think I'll let you quit? You ain't got no right to stop me. No, I got a right to see that you don't open that big blabbing mouth of yours. I got that right. I knows when I'm well off. I ain't doing no talking. Maybe I'd better make sure of that. <laughs> yeah, always one for making jokes, aren't you? This don't happen to be no joke. We murdered six men back at Mangareva, you and me. We're the only ones knows about it. I think you better ship with me when the Nancy Hale pulls out in the morning. Yeah. I think you better. I ain't shipping on no more pearl boats, and I ain't going nowhere near Mangareva. Now, that's final. All right, Foggy. That's how you feel about it. Open the window, will you? It's hot in here. It ain't a bit hot. You've been drinking too much. Open it anyway. Thanks. Yeah. Nice view of the harbor from there, Foggy. Pretty with all them lights blinking. Uh, Bull, how's about giving me half the 20 pounds you've got left? Sure. Why not? Yeah. Two five-pound notes. Uh, much obliged, Bull. If I wasn't so set on going home, I... What, what are you holding my wrist for? You're going out the window, Foggy. You're going to fall out. No, I ain't done nothing. I want to make sure you won't do anything. Let go of me, Bull. Let go. So long, Foggy. Bull. Bull. <laughs> Twelve stories to the street. <laughs> you won't talk now, Foggy. Not at all. <laughs> Off on that jib halyard, Dave. More! More! Okay, reefer up. Stand by to heave anchor. All right. You, Manu, lend a hand with that winch. All right, let her go. Anchor down and holding, sir. Make her fast. Aye, aye, sir. Make her fast, Manu. What, sir? Yeah, this is it. Stole the I I in the sir business, Dave. We ain't formal on the Nancy Hale. That suits me all right. So that's Mangareva, is it? Ain't much to look at. Best pearl bed in the South Seas, right under us. Won't even bother with a small boat today. Work right from the sloop. Get the divers over. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, boss. Get your boys over. Oh, no, good for me, headman. Go fast. You learn, Dave. First dive's taken by the head man. These boys are new to this spot and won't go under till he comes up and says it looks clear. All right. All right, Mano. Got eight beauties out of here last trip, Dave. You're going to be real glad you shipped with me. Hi, uh, Mano, come. Hi, uh, Mano, come. Give him a hand. Here you are. Good. Pick, pick what's out of here, pick. Bad water. Uh, Shut up! What's the matter with you, Manu? Me, Dive. Go to bottom. Six men down there. 
dead. You're crazy. No pity. Big dead men. They stand up like they live. My boys know that here. But what? Hey, wait a minute, Manu. What do you mean there's six dead men down there standing up? Like live, they're standing up. But they dead. I shut up from you. Shut up. Now the rest of you listen to me. You'll die, or I'll know the reason why. I came here to get pearls, and you're going to get them. There'll be no acting up on my boat. Dave! Dave, there's a diving helmet and lead shoes in one of the starboard lockers. Get them out. Test the air hose in the pump. Know anything about diving equipment? Plenty, but I never went down myself. You won't have to. I'm going down. I'll prove to these beggars there's nothing wrong down there. Okay, Captain? Yeah, just about touching bottom. Ease up on the rope a little. Let the rope go, Manu. Easy. Easy. Take a bite in it. That better, Bull? Yeah, much better. Keep that air pump and hand generator going. Don't worry. Yeah, how's it look down there? Can't see much yet. Gotta get used to it. Lean forward when you walk. You need more rope? Oh, it's okay. I ain't doing any walking. All I want to do is stay down here a couple of minutes and prove to those native beggars that... Captain, what is it? Pull me up! Hold on that rope! What is it, Bull? What happened? Get me up, Dave! Get me up! Now don't come near me! Oh, no! Rope, duck, no can fool! It can't be, duck! Lay on it, all of you! Dave! Dave! Pull me up! We're doing our best, Bull! What's down there? Six men! One who's right! They're standing in the water and turning at me! in our next performance. Come. <laughs> Come. Come. Hello? No, I'm not Pamela North. I... Hmm. He hung up, as usual. Maybe I'd better practice up on my falsetto. Oh, in a hurry this time. Hello? I am not... Dead. Oh, hold oh, the door. Maybe he didn't believe me. No, I'm not Pamela North. I... Well, of course not. I am. <laughs> oh, hello, Pam. <laughs> oh, I'm glad to be home, darling. Wasn't the reunion fun? It was awful. Everybody sat around noticing how much older everybody else looked. Postmortem, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, darling, is there a man in your life? Of course, dear. You. There must be somebody else. 
because I'm pretty sure I haven't been calling myself up and asking me if I weren't Pamela North. Darling, you're not well. I'm in perfect health. Listen, some goon has been phoning every hour and asking for you. As soon as I convince him that I'm not you, he hangs up. Well, that's well, reasonable enough, I but... I wonder uh... if it has anything to do with the little man. What little man? The one who followed him home. Maybe I should have asked you about the men in your life. Certainly, darling. The street was so dark and he was so uh, gray, sort of, and indistinct. I ran. Did he run after you? I don't know. I would have. You did. <laughs> but you slowed up for me. Oh. Uh, you answer it. I wouldn't want to disappoint him again. All right, darling. Hello? Yes, this is Pamela North. Uh, what did you... Uh, hello? Jimmy. I know. He hung up. Probably thinks it's good, clean fun. You know, darling, I am getting scared. Yeah, nothing to get scared about. You're beautiful and... Come here to the window. All right, darling. Wait. Is that your little man coming down the street? Yes, Jerry. He's looking up at the house numbers. I thought he was only a nasty little old man, but... Come away from the window. What are you going to do? Call the police. Oh, uh, I may just be imagining things, Jerry. My imagination can't be that vivid. It may have been a car backfiring. I know those were shots. I'll take a look. Jerry, don't you go near that window. Relax, darling. No one could see me up here. Funny. What is? He's deserted. The little man? He's gone, too. Maybe that was a car backfiring. At any rate, most people would think so. Darling, we've heard guns being fired too often. Well, whoever fired those shots isn't there anymore. Neither is your little man. I sort of suspect he's disappeared from our lives. I hope. That was our doorbell. Uh-huh. Let's make believe we're not home, Jerry. It might be important. That's what I mean. I'd better see who that is. It's silly being terrified by, by nothing, Pam. You can answer the door if you wish, darling, but I'm going to keep right on being terrified. Well, if you insist. Oh, no. No, I'm going with you. I want to be terrified in company. All right, but get over to one side. I'm going to open the door. All right, darling. It's the little man. So it is. Won't you uh, come in, please? Thank you. Shut the door, darling. Uh-huh. Are you... Come on, North. Yes, I am. Sherry, he's ill. Not ill. Please, let me speak. They will kill you, Pamela. You need a doctor. You better not bring yourself by speaking. Must speak. Don't need doctors. Must speak. I had them red line by. Kill Pamela North. That. That. Oh, oh, he's gone. I've got him. He collapsed oh. suddenly. Hot rats up. I'll lay him down here on the sofa. Get his coat open. Shall I phone for a doctor, darling? No. There's nothing a doctor can do for him. Dead? Chest full of bullets. Yes, he's dead. Oh, the poor little man. But who... He came here to warn you against a murderer, darling. But the murderer got to him first. <laughs> Well, well, what is all this, do you suppose? Why do you think anyone would want to kill Mrs. Pamela North? She seems to be the perfectly harmless young woman, don't you think? But there must be a reason. Well, I'm afraid we'll have to wait for our next performance. And our guests will be the famous amateur detectives, Mr. and Mrs. North. Oh, uh, incidentally, we are interested in your reaction to our shows. So why don't you write to the Mystery Playhouse, Armed Forces Radio, Los Angeles, USA, telling us what you like or don't like or anything you care to say. If you do that, we'd appreciate hearing from you very much. This is Peter Laurie closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight.
Oasis Radio Service. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness, I'm Darren Marlar. The coyote, or coyote, is one of the most mysterious and magical creatures within the mythology of Native Americans, and it's noted for its shape-shifting abilities. Before we get to that issue, however, a bit of background information on the animal is first required. Coyotes are of the dog family and are formidable and deadly hunters. While they typically go for small prey like rabbits and squirrels, they have been known to take on fully grown deer, even cattle. They're noted for their swimming skills and for the fact that they can run at high speeds. That all said, there is another side to the coyote, one which revolves around shapeshifting. Perceived almost unanimously by Native Americans as a trickster-like animal, the coyote is said to have the ability to control the weather, specifically rain and storms. And like so many other trickster entities, such as fairies and goblins, coyote can be friendly, playful, and helpful. But, and also like all tricksters, coyote has a dark side. It can be manipulative, deceitful, and even deadly, and as the mood takes it. As for what Native American lore says of the shape-shifting abilities of coyote, we are told that the animal can take on human form, usually in the guise of a man with a large mustache. Coyotes are said to be able to transform into the forms of birds, fish, and cats. Also, according to Native American mythology, witches and those familiar with magical rituals can transform themselves into coyotes. Thus, a coyote seen running wildly late at night might well be a shape-shifting witch or wizard embarking on some dark and disturbing mission. And we are far from being done with the coyote and its skills as a shapeshifter. There's a long-standing tradition among Native Americans that coyote will stalk hunters in the woods and on the plains. Then, when it closes in on its victim, the coyote will supernaturally shed its coat, which it quickly throws over its quarry. It's this action that allows coyote to shapeshift into the exact appearance of its victim. Typically, legend suggests this is done to allow the animal to have sex with the wife of the victim, coyotes and folklore having a particular liking for women. While many people might relegate such accounts to the domain of legend, the matter of shapeshifting and coyotes continues even in the world today. It's an issue that brings us back to the mystery of the chupacabra. It was in 1995 that the phenomenon of the chupacabra exploded across Puerto Rico. In early 2000s, however, reports began to surface suggesting that the chupacabra had somehow made its way to the United States, and specifically to the Lone Star State. In South Texas in 2003 and 2004, ranchers reported seeing strange, hairless creatures on their properties that attacked and killed their animals, such as chickens and goats. That all of this paralleled what was afoot in Puerto Rico inevitably provoked claims that hordes of chupacabras were on the loose, and possibly all across Texas. Whereas the Puerto Rican original was described as bipedal, glowing-eyed, and winged, the monster of the Lone Star State looks like a large, hairless coyote, which is exactly what it was and still is. Unlike the situation in Puerto Rico where a specimen has never been caught or killed, 
In Texas, it did not take long at all before a couple of the beasts were shot by irate farmers and hit by cars. A careful study of the dead animals conclusively proved they were coyotes, but they were not normal coyotes. They had certain genetic mutations, and that brings us back to this whole matter of shape-shifting. In the old Native American tales, the coyote could transform itself into numerous different creatures, even that of a person. What we saw in the 2000s, however, eerily paralleled the ancient legends, but in upgraded 21st century fashion. What was thought to be severe cases of mange on the dead coyotes was nothing of the sort. The animals in question appeared to be mutating into a completely hairless offshoot of the regular South Texas coyote population. They had developed large overbites, and their front limbs were abnormally short, something which led them to run in an odd, hopping fashion. And then there was the presence of curious pouches growing out of the upper parts of their hind legs. Strangest of all, several witnesses claimed to have seen the animals rise up onto their back legs and hold the position for several minutes as they scanned the landscape. The Texas chupacabra, which was actually something arguably even stranger, was born. And yet another layer of legend was added to the mythology surrounding the coyote and its shape-shifting skills. Ken Gerard, a noted cryptozoologist and monster hunter, suspects that the strange transformation of the Texan coyote is due to mutagens, which can affect animals at a DNA level, and almost certainly sulfur dioxide, which is a byproduct of coal-burning power plants. Notably, Ken has discovered that many sightings of these transformed coyotes have been made in the direct vicinity of Texas-based plants, something which leads him to strongly suggest this is the answer to the riddle. So we have a shape-shifting coyote in centuries-old Native American tales, and we have a changing thing in 21st century Texas. From the world of the supernatural to that of science and environmental pollution, the coyote continues to shapeshift, but in very different ways. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. The glass you just heard broken was not ordinary glass. It was a closed vessel of exact contour of the man's head which it held. It was raised exactly one millimeter above the skin, all around, and above the hair. No small feat since the hair on the head was lush and curly. Another masterpiece by Dom Llewellyn, whose secret of blowing glass to enclose human heads died when he died. Dom Llewellyn had been called in to do a job of work on what was left of Mr. John Hayes, which was all above the neck. So tonight, my report to you on John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. Crime Classics. A series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land, from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again, Mr. Thomas Highland. The 18th century was only a few years old, and the town was Warwick, 
and the season was spring. Things were budding all around, trees, flowers, and there happened to be a 16-year-old girl named Catherine Hall. She appears suddenly in history, this girl walking down the road. Suddenly, because nobody knows what parentage put her there. Isn't that nice? A young girl swinging down a road in May. Tra-la-la-la-la-la-la. la 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 lying Skipping. Stops. Uh, together nuts. And alongside her, three soldiers. Officers of His Majesty's Dragoons and gentlemen. Gentlemen three and guardians of Catherine. And Lieutenant Ombersley has the papers in his bandolier to prove it. Guardians and their ward at a crossroads. Catherine? Yes, Uncle? Uncle Fred and Uncle Ned and I think the time has come... For what, Uncle? The time has come... Do not be shy. How is it that always you are shy when the sun shines? We have a wedding gift for you. Uncle? From all of us to you. Uncles? The gift, here. A scarf. Uncles? We'll miss you. And I you. And the time now to tell you of him, of the man you will marry... Of the man who comes down this road and on to take you from us. From Uncle Fred and Uncle Ned and myself. Is he as tall as you? He is very rich. Is he as handsome as Uncle Ned? He is very rich. And has he the strength of Uncle Fred? He is very rich. But I know I shall love him well. Catherine. Yes, Uncle. Your duty is as wife. Yes, Uncle. Always water in the pail and loving nuptials cannot fail. And? Happy marriage in a springtime day. Child in the cradle on New Year's Day. Oh, yes, Uncle. Oh, yes, Uncle. Ah, he is prompt. I die with impatience. He has a fine span of horses, see? I'm trembling. Oh, John Hayes! Oh! You, girl. If your name be Catherine, get in. Uncle? Get in, girl, get in. A kiss, Uncle, for farewell to you and Uncle Ned. Which we did in tears and kisses the whole night past. Get in, girl, get in. Here's your money, Lieutenant. Small sackful, as was contracted for. Giddy up. They were married that night, these impetuous 18th century lovers, these young people, Catherine Hall and John Hayes. History records that it was a rather hectic marriage. Uh, The groom's father went temporarily blind from drink before the ceremony. Uh, There was unruliness among the servants, and some sources state that the bride herself tried to sneak off and had to be restrained. But married they were just as evening sun went down. And that evening, after the house of John Hayes had quieted down, After the pig had been eaten and the toast drunk, after the celebrants had gone home and the windows bolted and the doors barred, after all these things... (laughs) There you are! There you are! Come on out now! (laughs) There you are! Uh, Liberty bird! You know what you ought to do. (sighs) What? Join the army. Join the army? Join the army. Why should I do that? I'd be so proud of you. Uh, Aren't you proud of me now? Think of you in a uniform. I I never did. Then let's do it. Uh, All right. The scarlet trousers and the scarlet coat. Oh, my. And the golden sash and the gleaming scabbard. And I'd stand up straight like this. On your curly hair, a three-cornered hat and a cockade. And I'd march. And I'd march. And perhaps... Uh, What? They'd send you to America. Yes. No. You would volunteer for it. No. You'd miss me too much. You'd suffer. Oh, I'd write to you every day. The boats to America do not sail very often. I'd knit things for you and bake things for you. But mostly... What? I'd be proud. Oh, so proud. Dear John. Well, I don't know. Join the army. (laughs) Proud? Yes. What would you do? Tell people. Uh, John. Yes. Golden sash and gleaming scabbard. And on your head a three-cornered hat with a cockade, John. And you'd march so straight and tall. You'd march. Um, 
Like this? Yes. Like this? Yes. Oh, yes. Dear Father, I am writing this letter to tell you that I have just come back from a 20-mile march under full pack and I do not like it. In the six months I have been in the army, I have not found a thing that I like about it. It is march, 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 march. In spite of my education, I am still but a grenadier. Two of the lads who joined the army with me are lieutenants and wear cockades, so please... Dear Father, present the government with 20 pounds and secure my release from this life. I would do it with my own funds, but I had wisdom enough to assign my wealth to my wife's name before joining the army. I do not wish to bother Catherine in this matter, as I am going to surprise her by my appearance in civilian garb and put an end to her loneliness. Please, Father, do me this favor, your loving son, John. Oh, P.S. Please, Father... Just consider it alone. <laughs> that curious tailor from Tottenham. <laughs> Mr. Wood, you're the one. And how about me? Oh, you're a one too, Mr. Billings. You're... If it's the butcher boy, Mr. Wood. Yeah, I'll send him on his way. Hi. Who are you? Who are you? I am John Hayes. Who? John Hayes. Oh, you be in the army. Not now. I am John Hayes and I've come home to my wife. Where is she? Uh, Catherine! Who is it? Catherine! Catherine, I'm home! Dirty deserter! No! Oh, shame! Well, listen, I'm out of the army! But you cannot be! I just sent you a sweater! I'm out! M my father paid a bounty for me and I'm home again. Who are these men, Catherine? I'm, uh, Billings, the cooper. I be Wood, the alehouseman. Tradesman? Aye. Well, what do we need a cooper and an alehouseman here? Questioning me, husband? Well, I'd like to know why a cooper and an ale. Welcome husband. out! I welcome out! Ready here! Come to out! Drink a cheer, boy! Run to hero, come to out! Run to hero, come to out! Come to out! Come to out! Come to out! Uh, oh, husband. Oh, dear wife. I was so proud of you when you were gone. And you told people. Oh, yes. Drink a cheer. Yeah. Drink a cheer. <laughs> and now, wife. We will celebrate you and me and Mr. Billings and Mr. Wood. Well, I Happy thought. thought. We'll have a celebrate. John, you're dusty from the road. Go wash. There's a full pail, always a full pail, always waiting for your return. Go wash. Uh, uh, yes. Mr. Wood. Hi, Katie. Mr. Billings. How did you come to marry such a one, Kate? He's very rich. And he's come home. His wealth is assigned in my name. I receive it but in driblets. Mm, poor lady. Shame. If I were a widow... The money... All at once. All mine. Billings? Aye. Let's make a widow. And uh, how to do that? You kill an husband, you make a widow. <sighs> Ain't that an axe above the fireplace? Oh, dear friends. I washed Catherine. I was proud. Ruddy hero. <laughs> A soldier had come home, to his wife, to his neighbors. There was wine in the room and a good fire. But it was one of the shortest celebrations on record. You 
are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Highland. This Saturday night, learn the true details of the Wheel of Misfortune case on Gangbusters. When a wheel, gangland terminology for a driver in a crime, runs afoul of the law, he cuts himself out of the crime in question. After the robbery comes off, the wheel declares himself in for a cut of the spoils and murder results before police clamp the lid on the crooks. Gangbusters, this Saturday night on most of these same stations. The same evening to listen for CBS Radio's thrilling Gunsmoke series. And now once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics. And his report to you on John Hayes, his head, and how they were parted. Historical background. We are concerned here with England in the early 1700s. George I sat upon the throne, and the terms Whig and Tory were being muttered and bandied about and chalked on walls. During one February, the great Sir Hugh Burdenny took time away from the Navy, and went ashore long enough to invent the side pocket, only to die a year later in the Fijis. And in April, a month which concerns us most, King George put his queen in prison because of her part in the von Königsmark affair. But we are concerned most with a citizen of the time, Mr. John Hayes. We hear of him next on the evening of April 22nd. Two lovers who had never heard of him strolled along the Thames. Strolled. Let's sit here, Duck. No, Thomas. So they strolled on. Mary. Duck. Let's sit here. Oh, no. And on. I like it here beneath the bridge, don't you? Well... See how the shadows lie like lacy web? Where? Yon. Oh. Let us sit and watch and see how they quiver. As riding moon, a trail in the sky. Here? Yeah. Just so. Mary. Duck. You are dear to me. Hush. And how to wash this torrent inside me. Fair Mary. Fairest and most lovely. And now the blushes to your cheek beneath the moon. Thomas. Yes, Mary. I too. Thomas. This is an unreality which we see, Mary. A conjugation of shadow and moonlight and... But it has such curly hair. Lacy shadows. And eyes and lips that grin... A head with no body, there in the mud. It'll go away. How can it? It's an abomination. Come... It's not real. It is real. It is not. Go see. Duck. Go see. All right. Well? Go. A head... Of a man. Of a curly-headed man. I knew it. Thomas Ascot, I did not want to come down here in the first place. You made me. You made me. My head. Go. So they discovered the head in the mud of the Thames. And after they married, they had a lot to talk about. It was the head of John Hayes, all right, but nobody knew it then. Thomas Ascot reported his unusual find to the constabulary, who went to the spot, saw that the lad was indeed a truthful lad, poked about searching for a body to go with the head, failed, and then brought back what had been found to the sheriff's offices. They cleaned and combed the find, known as dressing the head in the trade. Then they mounted it neatly on a ten-foot pole. This was the custom of the day. Whenever an extra head was found, mounted on a pole, exhibited in the town square so it could be identified. Nobody, however, came forward in the prescribed three days, so Dom Llewellyn was called in. Uh, do that thing you do with glass, Dom, he was told, uh, with heads, and close this one for preservation purposes. And Dom did, with caliper and a secretly fashioned glass and blowpipe. And Tom did. In the meanwhile, back at the home of Catherine Hayes, 
She's just stepped out of her door on her way to the cheese stall. Mrs. Hayes! <laughs> Mrs. Hayes! Good morning to you, Mrs. Martin. Good morning to you. A marketing? A marketing. Mind you if I go along, if I walk with you. Neighbor who walks alone, neighbors alone. Aye. Wise was the poet who first said that. Mrs. Hayes. Yes? A question. Ninny do. How go your two boarders? A pace. So? Yes. Mr. Wood is an attractive one, wouldn't you say? In truth, I had not noticed. Nonny, nonny, nonny. In truth, I suppose you'll say you have not noticed the prettiness of Mr. Billings. Not at all. Through the goodness of my heart for poor tradesmen, they live in my cellar. In truth, I never see them. And Mr. Hayes, your husband. Of him what? I have not seen him. I heard he has returned from the army, but I have not seen him. No wonder. No wonder? If he is on his way to Portugal, how could you see him? How indeed? But Mrs. Hayes. Yes? So long he was in the army. Then home to such a young and comely as you. Then within four days he offs to Portugal. Oh, restless John. My last words to him as he left. Restless indeed. Huh. Would that my husband were restless like that and off to Portugal. And a cooper like that Mr. Billings about. Some has all the looky. And Mrs. Martin shook her head sadly all the way to the cheese dolls. There, she selected a good round edam and went home and told all the neighbors that John Hayes had hied off to Portugal. And neighbors told neighbors and everybody was satisfied. For a week. For it was a week later that Mrs. Martin went down to London on a visit to a friend. It was an infrequent trip for Mrs. Martin and her friend took her around to show her the sights. The finest statuary, the best inns, and on a Sunday afternoon, he took her to see a head which had been encapsulated by Dom Llewellyn, and which was on exhibition at the Constabulary Museum. And seeing it, Mrs. Martin said this. Why, well, I do believe I knew that man. And her friend took her to the sheriff, to whom she repeated herself. Why, well, I do believe I know that man. What man? Why, well, the man in that room there. The one whose head's in the glass. You know him, you say? Did he? You're certain? Diddy, diddy do. Who is he? A neighbor to me. Husband to a young lass, poor lass. Ah? Uh? Poor lass, barely seventeen, I'd say. And her husband dead in such a way. Who is she? What's her name? Catherine. Catherine Hayes. And he who you've got, like you've got, is her hubby, dear. John Hayes. I'll be confused, I'll be. How? What's he doing in that room? Like he is when he's in Portugal. What's he doing there indeed? Madam. I. Will you take me to your neighbor? Didi. Didi, I will. What say you, Katie? Oh, settle it between you. <laughs> Listen to me, ale house man. I'd as soon slit your gullet as look at you. I'll do it if you don't leave us alone. Chalky, that's all you're good at, Billings. Come to me so I can let the air out of you with a knife. Oi! Oh, settle it between uh, you. Yes, who be you? Sheriff of London Town. For what? If you be Mrs. John Hayes, I come to take you with me. For what? To show you of your husband, if he be the one whose head we have. Head? Aye. And, madam? Aye? The two men I espy over your shoulder, may I inquire of their worth? Friends to me. And your husband? I would say so. We will all ride down to London Town.
And now, Mr. Wood, I will show you a thing. Come with me. Look, you. <gasps> who is this man whose head is in this glass? I do not know. Who is this man? I do not know. I swear it. I am a pious man. And when I swear a thing, it is sworn to. And it is the truth. Very well. Sit there. Mr. Billings! Close the door, please. Walk to that table, Mr. Billings, and tell me whose head it is encased there. Mr. Billings? Aye. What have you done with the rest of Mr. Hayes? Mr. Hayes? Did you put an axe in such a way as to sever his head? Me? You. No. Very well. Sit there. Mrs. Hayes, please. Is that your husband's head who is on the table? No. You are not looking at the head, Mrs. Hayes. Nor do I need to. For my beloved husband, my strength and my love is in Portugal. Mrs. Hayes. What? Will you look at the head, please? I will not. I will bring it to you so you can see. Do not. For what reason? Do not. Do not. Do not. Do not. How can it be my hubby loved John when he is in... <gasps> Pretend, Mrs. Hayes. Pretend he is not in Portugal, and so pretending tell me, is this your husband? No. Are you sure? It is not my husband. Perhaps you need a better look. No, no, it is not John, not him. I hold him by the hair and close to you. Now tell me. John, John, hubby love. Your husband? Yes. Yes, oh, yes. And how got he here? They, they did it. Billings and Wood. Say, liar! No shame and no lies. You, the two of you evil men, killed him and severed his head. Aye, while you fetched a pail to catch his head. And laughed as you caught it. In the name of his majesty, I charge the three of you. Charge them, not me. The three of you. And the three of them were tried. Billings and Wood on the charge of murder. Catherine on the charge of petty treason, which was 18th century talk for killing one's husband. All were found guilty. Wood died in jail. Billings was hung in chains. And Catherine... Let me read to you from a journal of the times concerning Catherine. An iron chain was placed about her body and fixed to a stake. On these occasions, when women were burned for petty treason... It was customary to strangle them by means of a rope passed round the neck and pulled by the executioner, so that they were dead before the flames reached the body. But the flames leaped so high that the executioner burned his hands so that he could not strangle, so that Catherine Hayes was burned alive. It is interesting to note that a graph of petty treason in England for a whole year after that shows a decided drop before it picks up again. In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. John Hayes, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed and conducted by Bernard Herman, and the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Betty Harford was heard as Catherine, Jeanette Nolan as Mrs. Martin, and Alastair Duncan as John Hayes. Featured in the cast were Ben Wright, Richard Peel, Charles Davis, and William Johnstone. Bob Lamont speaking. Here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, Mahadwat, India, in the year 1894. 
We will concern ourselves with a father and son who just didn't get along, uh, to the point where one of them had to go. My report to you will be on Rashi among the crocodiles and the prank he played. Thank you. Good night. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Ann Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. On January 17, 1892, Officer Masterson of the New York City Police arrested a man the police and press had dubbed Jack the Slasher. Since December 29th, Jack the Slasher had been on a rampage, cutting the throats of seven men with a straight razor, leaving one of them dead. About 3 a.m., the morning of the arrest, Officer Masterson noticed a hard-looking man walking the streets of the Bowery and followed him to see what he was up to. The man stopped for a minute to speak with a drunk, then led the drunk down James Street. Masterson rushed in when he saw the man attack the drunk, pulling a razor across his throat. When he saw the officer, the assailant fled. Masterson fired three shots which missed, but attracted the attention of other officers in the area. The policeman ran him down and put him under arrest. The victim, William Muller, was taken to the hospital. His wounds were severe, but he would recover. Jack the Slasher was actually Henry G. Dowd, a 30-year-old mentally ill man who had spent much of his adult life in mental institutions. He spent several years in the Flatbush Insane Asylum before escaping in 1874 by picking a lock and climbing through a transom. Soon after, he was arrested for assault and sentenced to five years in state prison. He served two years, then was pardoned through the influence of rich relatives. In 1891, he was arrested in New York, judged to be insane, and committed to the asylum on Ward's Island. Six months later, he was pronounced sane by a jury of experts and released. Inspector Burns of the New York Police intensely questioned Dowd and got him to admit to several of the slashings. He said the impulse to kill was uncontrollable. He wanted to kill all Dutchmen and Germans. The reason for this is that a German had once ravished his mother at their home in Brooklyn. The face of the ravisher still haunted him, and he wanted to kill any man who looked like him. The victim who had died, John Carson, a lawyer from Baltimore, had not been German, but his throat was slashed in the same area and the same time frame as the others, and it was believed that Dowd was his killer. Dowd at first denied killing Carson, but under continued questioning became violently excited and said, I cut him because I thought he was a blank Dutchman. I hate Dutchmen, and I never see one who looks like that, but I want to kill him. I can't help it. Henry Dowd's brother John was also arrested, partially because he was known to be a religious maniac and it was suspected that the same murderous strain might run in his blood. John Dowd denounced his brother, saying that he's a bad man who does not believe there is a God or in heaven or hell. E. A. White, a distant relative who had served as Henry Dowd's guardian for several years, told police that the family had come to America from Liverpool, England. He said Henry Dowd's assertion that his mother had been assaulted by a German was entirely untrue, 
it was a hallucination of Dowd's crazed intellect. When it was learned that Henry Dowd had been born in England and had traveled back several times to his homeland, it was speculated that Dowd may have in fact been London's Jack the Ripper come to America. Inspector Burns was quick to point out that Dowd's time was accounted for and he was not in England at the time of the Whitechapel murders. It was impossible that he was Jack the Ripper. On January 29th, Henry Dowd was tried for assault. There had not been enough evidence to charge him with the murder of John Carson, but he was caught red-handed cutting the throat of William Muller. Dowd had first claimed self-defense. Muller had shoved him, and fearing for his life, he defended himself. However, at his trial, he pleaded insanity. It did not take long for the jury to return a verdict of not guilty on the grounds of insanity at the time of the commission of the act. Jack the Slasher was committed to the State Asylum for Insane Criminals at Auburn, New York. When Weird Darkness returns, shortly after the terrorist attack on New York on September 11, 2001, another terrorist attack began. This time, it was targeting public figures. The weapon of choice was anthrax, and the method of delivery was the U.S. Post Office. But first, an incestuous love triangle between a young woman, her uncle, and a restaurant chef ends up in murder. That story is up next. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Mr. Hedges, this is all we can dig up on that story about the missing Hollywood people. Well, we can't wait any longer. we got to go to press. Let's see what you got. Yeah. Story from the film Capital. More than a week ago, November 20th to be exact, Philip Hayward, young cinema star of yesterday's bread, and the popular actress Judith Johnson set sail for New Zealand aboard Hayward's private yacht. As chaperone, Miss Johnson's movie director father accompanied the pair, and it's reported that... Johnson Sr. is taking advantage of the sea voyage to complete his original cinema yarn, a story of the strange creatures who live beneath the surface of the sea. That was more than a week ago. Word's been received from New Zealand that the Hayward yacht's more than two days overdue. A careful check gives evidence that there have been no disturbances on the Pacific throughout the time the party's been aboard. Special searching parties fail to discover the whereabouts of the boat. Question in Hollywood tonight, the question everywhere is, what's happened to the trio aboard the Dolphin? Where are they? Have they become victims of the fantastic creatures created in the imagination of the author-director aboard the yacht? That is this week's unsolved mystery. Will it ever be? Oh, that's all right. Uh, boy. Right. Get this down to makeup. Let's get rolling. Right away. Stop that fool noise, will you? Oh, take it easy, Johnson. 
No reason to start shouting at each other, you know. Now, look here. We've been becalmed for two days and a night now. We haven't moved a knot one way or the other. Well, I assure you there's nothing wrong with the motors. I've been over them myself. For some fantastic reason, they just refuse to start again. Why? Why won't they start? I don't know. Why did they stop in the first place? Oh, it's weird. It's like, well, like some strange spirit has descended upon the boat. Oh, nonsense. Is it nonsense? There are many terrifying legends about sea spirits, fantastic adventures that have happened to sailors at sea. No, just a lot of myths. Who knows what strange creatures lurk beneath the sea's surface? Who can tell what might come up out of the depths at any moment? Oh, stop it. You're talking like a superstitious old fool. <laughs> you made too many goofy movies. Just because you won an Academy Award is no sign I'm going to swallow the tripe you dish out in those eight real clam lakes of no. yours. No. Judy. You can't. Hey, what's the matter with you? You can't. I... No. I won't let you. Daughter. Daughter, hey, wake up. No. You can't do it. No. No, I can't. No. No. Judy. No. Judy, darling. What in the name of heaven? Judy. Oh. Are you all right? Oh, oh. oh, I was asleep, dreaming. Oh, oh, it was horrible. I'd say it was a nightmare. Oh. I, I dreamed I was talking to a young girl. Yet, she didn't seem like a girl at all. She, she looked more like a mermaid. A what? She was like a nymph from the sea. I, I thought she stood looking at me. She told me she'd been dead for centuries. And yet, not really dead. <laughs> I couldn't understand what she meant. She said something about her body being dead. But her mind being free to wander about the world. Fantastic. Oh, Dad, it was ghastly. She kept trying to convince me that I should let her mind enter my body. Well, what did she say she wanted to do? She said the entire civilization of the earth depended upon the task she had to perform. Oh, Phil, she she seemed to be actually trying to force me out of my body so she could enter it. Judy, what did this creature look like? Oh, she was awful looking, Dad. She had long hair. Green and slimy like seaweed. Her teeth were brilliant red. They were long and, and pointed kept staring at me with her little beady eyes. They were horrible, for there were no eyelids. She never blinked once. She just stared and stared. Yes? What else, Judy? It was horrible when she touched me. She had long, narrow fingers with no nails on them, and they were covered with fish-like scales. That's positively the most amazing thing I've ever heard of. Mr. Howard. Oh, yes, Ned. What is it? Oh, I say, look at the lad. Why, what's wrong, boy? You're pale as a ghost. Mr. Hayward. The dolphin. She's moving. The boat's moving. Good. The man got the motor started. No, sir. That's just it. The motors aren't running. And there's no wind. But the boat's making about 20 knots an hour. Oh. Why, why this, this boat couldn't possibly move without motors. That's not all. There's a man at the helm steering the boat. And he's a man none of us have ever seen before. Man, are you sure? Sure as I'm standing here, sir. And he's the strangest thing I've ever seen. Well, let's go have a look at him. Hey, come on. You, you best stay here. No, oh, no. No, I'm not going to stay here by myself. All right, come along, all of you. Follow me. Sort of an ancient sea chanty. Easy now. Maybe trouble. There he is, sir. You see, Mr. Hayward? Oh. Yeah. I say, Hayward. That's no man. It's some sort of a sea monster. Look at his hands, Mr. Hayward. The lad's right. Long, narrow fingers with webs between them. And 
No fingernails. Dad, Bill, they're like the hands of the girl in the dream. Oh, where's he taking us? Yes. I wonder. Behind us, sir. Oh, the Lord. A huge wall of water rising out of the sea. Get down those steps, everybody. Get down, everybody. Down the steps. Here, into the cabin. Hang on, hang on, everybody. Hurry, hurry. Everybody all right? Yeah. <coughs> yes, I am. Did, did Judy get down in the cabin? Yes, she made it. Just managed to close the door before the wave hit. Are you all right? Yes, okay. You, Judy? Oh, what in the world caused that? Yeah, what? No wind. And a wave of water. Hundreds of feet high. It's a miracle we didn't capsize. Look, sir. To the port side. Yes, Ned? It's land. Land by heaven. It can't be. Not in these waters. There's no land for 500 miles. And what's that over yonder? Mirage? No, sir. That's no mirage. It's land. It certainly is. Long, low coast. Extending north and south as far as you can see. A low, steaming land. Look. Look at the heavy vapors rising from it. You're right, Judy. It is steaming. That must explain the sultriness that's been around us these past two days. Why, I've been in these waters a dozen times. This has never been here before. It's an entire continent where there ought not to be anything but empty sea. Land from the sea. That explains the wave that swept over us. A wave that high could only have been caused by an undersea disturbance. Oh, nonsense, Johnston. You're trying to say an underwater convulsion forced this vast expanse of land up to the surface. Precisely. A land called Eban. Now, I'll have to have a better explanation than that. Things like entire continents rising up out of the ocean just don't happen. Well, then if, if Dad's not correct, what is the explanation? There is no other. A land called Eban did exist at one time, nearly 10,000 years ago. Ruled by a man named Bull and a woman named Lana. They both possessed wonderful powers and knowledge. Bull, the emperor, destroyed the continent of Eban. How? By releasing vast, unknown forces beneath the continent. Forces that only he and Lana knew how to control. But why did he destroy it? I, I, I don't seem to recall. I read the legend once, doing research for one of my pictures. It seems that for some reason or other, Bull and the girl were to release their spirits from their bodies. And those spirits were to have the power someday of recalling the sunken land from the sea. Then if, if such a story is true, that must be the land of Eban we're approaching. Not at all impossible. And if it is true, couldn't that monstrous chanting thing at the helm be Bull himself? Oh, Dad. Taking us with him back to his long lost kingdom. You don't actually believe that, do you, Johnston? Why not? Well, I certainly don't. Well, Phil, what else can we believe? That wave couldn't have swept us off our course enough to put us in sight of this land. Besides, look at it. Steaming. And that sultry, foul odor. Land covered with seaweed. There's no one at the helm, sir. That monster's disappeared. Oh, but look. There's someone lying on the deck beneath the wheel. It's a man. Yes. Yeah, maybe that thing's met with a bit of hard luck. A uh, couple. Couple, hey, what? Right. He's breathing. Only slightly. I say, who is he? Not a member of the crew. Well, how'd he get on board? Why is he lying here on deck? What's happened to him? Oh, he's conscious. Uh, he's trying to tell us something. Uh, Look here. Who uh, are you? I... Stowaway. Hit... Hit in... Supply room. Went... To sleep, I... in the supply room and went to sleep. Wait a minute. He's dead. 
Hey, what? I'm going to have a look over here. Oh, oh Judy, Judy. Oh, Phil, I, I feel so strange. Oh, dear, you look ill. So very strange. You'd better go below to the cabin, dear. Yes, I, I'd better. I'll lie down for a while. Shall I go with you, dear? No. No, I'll be all right if I rest a little while. All right, dear. Be careful going to your cabin. Yes. Oh, Ned. Get a tarpaulin and cover the body. Right away, sir. Hey, wait. Come over here a minute, will you? Uh, yes, Johnson. What is it? There. Have a look. See? Someone's climbed down that rope ladder and gone ashore through the mud and slime. Hmm. Whoever it was, he didn't sink in very deep. See, he's too thick. Kept him from sinking. I wonder who it was. I'm in favor of finding out. Oh, Ned. Yes, sir? We're going ashore. Watch out for Miss Blake, will you? Right, sir. And not a word of this to the rest of the crew, understand? Yes, sir. All right, Johnston. Down you go. Yeah. And follow those footprints and see where they lead us. smelling place I was ever in. Hold on. Look. Yeah. I see what you mean. A city up ahead there. A city. From the depths of the sea. I say, Johnston. Isn't that Captain Webb going into that low dome building over there? Eh? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. So that's our man. Ahoy, Captain. Captain Webb. Wait a minute, Captain. Hold up a bit. Hayward, he's turned around. That snarl on his face. He's got a gun in his hand. Hayward, it isn't Webb. It's that thing. What in the name of heaven is it? Stand back, the two of you. Stand back. What? You are not Captain Webb. I am Bull, Emperor of Eban. And I've returned to claim again my ancient kingdom. If you come one step nearer, I shall be compelled to slay you. You dare not, Boo. No, no. Judy. You seem surprised, Boo. Did you think I would forget? Lana. Judy, darling, what does this mean? Why do you speak so strangely? And why does this, this thing call you Lana? I am Lana, Philip Hayward. I have borrowed for a while the body of your beloved Judy. What? My mind, my spirit has entered her body. You see me as Judith Johnston, but now, now I am Lana, Empress of the Kingdom of Eban. I have returned to rule Eban. And I have returned to prevent it. You cannot prevent it, Lana. Look here, this quarrel is none of my affair. I demand that you release whatever power you have over my fiancé. I have borrowed her body only for a little while, Philip Hayward. Just as Boole has borrowed the body of the captain of your craft. Yeah. The body I first borrowed was a weak one. A sick stowaway. The captain's is a sturdy body. Now it is mine. But you must return it to him, Boole. It is the law. You must return his body unharmed. Just as I must return the body of Judith Johnson. It shall be so. I am about to enter the temple now. To regain my Ebonite body. You cannot open the burial chamber unless I accompany you. I realize that full well. I enter the temple now. I shall await you, Lana, beside the sepulcher. Look here, Lana. Oh, whoever you are, well, this is some horrible nightmare. Philip Hayward, we must act quickly. I will try to explain. When Bool destroyed Eban 10,000 years ago, we sealed our Ebonite bodies in a vacuum chamber inside this temple. And our spirits left our bodies to roam the universe until Eban should be restored. Now Bool intends to re-enter his body and build a new Eban. Once he does reclaim his ancient body, all is lost. For no one 
save me can destroy him. And if I slay him, I too must die. But what can you do? I have a plan. Come with me into the temple where Bool awaits. our ancient bodies, just as we left them so long ago. All is ready, Lana. We will break the vacuum, permit our spirits to enter our sleeping bodies. Are you prepared? I am prepared, Bool. Then we begin. Look, those bodies in the glass vacuum, they're beginning to move. Yes. Slowly. Slowly. Look at them. No. No, don't. Please, Lord. Judy, Judy, darling. Oh, no. I get here. Judy, thank heaven she's left you. You're yourself again. Look. They've left the vacuum. See? Up there. Oh, there she is. She's the one in my dream. You are free. All of you. Not so. The three of you will remain here forever to help rebuild the populace of Eban. You cannot fool. Fool is all great. All-powerful. Bool is the law. No one can defy. No one, Bool. Save me. You lack the courage, Lana. Not now. I have the courage now. You are cruel and wicked, Bool. Your rule in Chile band ended in horrible tragedy. It must not happen again. Put down the weapon, Lana. You dare not slay me. You'll die yourself. Then I call upon death to claim me. You dare not, Lana. You dare not slay the son of the ancient one. Yes, fool, yes. It has been written by the hand of destiny. Lana, think. Think before you slay me. It's beyond the realm of thought, fool. No. I destroy you, Lana. <laughs> That is the end. All is finished now. No, you must go. Can you come with us, Lana? No. But soon I perish also. You must hurry now. Leave Eban quickly. Go while yet you have time. Hasten before it is too late. trouble starting the motors, dear? None at all. Your father and Ned are down with the crew. The men don't even suspect what has happened to them. Well, just as well. They'd never believe it. Well, take a last look, Judy. You'll soon be out of sight of the land. Yes. Oh, I'm so glad it's all over, Phil. But poor Lana. She gave her life to save ours, Phil. Yes, darling. She did. What's that? Look. <gasps> Flames from the mainland, like a volcano. Phil, the land's sinking. It's Lana. Judy. She's released the forces. She's destroyed ancient Evan once again.
Sing from the Sea, an original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop. Eleanor Naylor Corrin was Judith Johnston. Ben Morris played Philip Hayward. Fred Wayne was heard as Johnston. Eugene Francis played Ned. Georgiana Cook was Lana. And Daryl McAllister was Boole, the thing from the sea. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. I'm Darren Marlar. If you're looking for Weird Darkness merchandise, you can find it in the Weird Darkness store. You can search through all the merchandise by clicking on Store at WeirdDarkness.com. L.P. Christensen was the proprietor of the Vienna House in Kansas City, Missouri in 1888. William E. Bell was the head cook at the hotel until August of that year when Christensen fired him for paying too much attention to his niece, Annie Christensen. Christensen was not exactly acting to protect his niece's virtue, though. He had eyes for Annie himself. L.P. scandalized the Vienna house when he left his wife and persuaded Annie to run away with him to Omaha. With her husband gone, Mrs. Christensen brought back William Bell to help run the hotel. The two soon became intimate, causing further scandal at the Vienna house. Mrs. Christensen and William Bell were soon at each other's throats. She fired him again and left for Omaha to find her husband. Before she left, Bell told her, if you bring Christensen back with you, I'll kill him. Despite the warning, Mrs. Christensen returned to Kansas City with her unfaithful husband. As soon as Bell learned that Christensen had returned, he started for the hotel. He was heard muttering, if he makes a move, I'll mean to blow him to blank. I've stood this razzle long enough and will end it tonight. Bell entered the hotel by the rear stairway leading to the second floor and made straight to Christian's room. He drew a 32 caliber bulldog revolver and fired twice. The first shot hit the wall above Christensen's head. The second struck him in the forehead above the right eye. Mrs. Christensen opened the door when she heard the first shot, and as her husband fell bleeding at her feet, she shrieked, "'Oh, God, Will, you're a murderer! You've killed my husband!' Bell ran outside to the pavement and raised the still-smoking revolver to his own head. He fired and instantly died. L.P. Christensen died later that day without regaining consciousness. Mrs. Christensen denied that she had been intimate with Bell and blamed it all on the love of the two men for Annie Christensen. On September 11, 2001, also known as 9-11, terrorists attacked the United States. Citizens were shocked, scared, and grieving. It was a time of deep paranoia and distrust. People wondered when and if the country would be attacked again. And then in a matter of days, another act of terrorism shook the country. A number of letters containing spores of the bacteria that causes anthrax were sent to public figures and media outlets. People who had been exposed to these letters, or even letters that had only come into contact with those anthrax letters, began falling ill. Anthrax is a disease that's caused by the bacteria Bacillus anthracis. It typically affects herbivore mammals but can infect any mammal, including humans. 
Most human anthrax infections result from contact with infected animals or infected animal byproducts. There are three ways to contract the disease – through open skin, breathing in spores, or ingesting the bacteria. It does not spread from one infected human to another. However, the fatal dosage is invisible to the naked eye. The anthrax letters of 2001 caused five deaths and 17 illnesses. All of them occurred in individuals who had inhaled the bacteria. Anthrax that is contracted through the lungs is the deadliest form of the disease. Symptoms start like the common cold and progress to severe difficulty breathing. Eventually, respiration becomes so challenging, victims have described the sensation as having your head held underwater. Roughly 75% of people who contract anthrax through their lungs will die. According to the FBI, there were four letters. There are claims of more, however. The first two went out on September 18, 2001. Their intended recipients were Tom Brokaw of NBC and the New York Post. Two more were sent October 9, 2001. The intended recipients of those letters were Senators Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy. All of the letters went out from the same mailbox in Newark, New Jersey. Through handwriting analysis, the FBI concluded that the same person wrote each of the letters. Of course, this did not rule out the possibility that a group planned the attack. The popular thinking initially was that a foreign terrorist group was responsible for it. Authorities knew that they had to quickly uncover the perpetrator. However, authorities did not uncover a foreign terrorist group. When it was found that the anthrax came from an American source, the FBI turned their attention to possible domestic terrorists. The first official person of interest in the 2001 anthrax letters case was Dr. Stephen Hatfield, an infectious disease bioweapons scientist with the U.S. Army. In 2002, under the direction of lead investigator Richard Lambert, the FBI raided his apartment wearing biohazard suits while TV cameras filmed the event. Then in August of that year, the Attorney General John Ashcroft publicly announced that Hatfield was a person of interest. Intense surveillance included tapping his phones, continuously searching his home, and scrutinizing his every move. On one occasion, FBI agents who had been following Hatfield ran over his foot when he approached their vehicle to confront them. The investigation was affecting every aspect of his life. And in 2006, the Energy Department's Oak Ridge National Laboratory illegally fired Hatfield from his job for whistleblowing. In March 2008, the FBI officially exonerated Hatfield of any wrongdoing. The courts subsequently awarded him $4.6 million in the settlement of a lawsuit he filed in 2003 against the government for violations of the Privacy Act. The next noteworthy person of interest in the anthrax letters case was an unassuming Army biodefense expert, Dr. Bruce Ivins. The FBI had concluded that the anthrax-causing bacteria had come from his laboratory. However, experts have since claimed that the FBI's evidence proved inconclusive. They subjected Bruce to the same scrutiny as Stephen. However, they found things that led them to believe that he was their guy. The doctor had a number of photos of blindfolded women on his computer. Later in the investigation, they found correspondence in which he claimed to have multiple personalities. Additionally, the FBI discovered that Bruce had a deep obsession with women. They also listened in on a conversation in which the doctor said that he couldn't remember mailing any anthrax letters. He also felt that he wasn't capable of such a thing. Dr. Bruce Ivins committed suicide when he ingested a fatal amount of Tylenol in 2008. He never confessed to the crimes, nor have investigators ever found direct evidence linking him to the anthrax letters. In February of 2010, the FBI officially closed their investigation into the anthrax letters of 2001. They concluded that Dr. Bruce Ivins was responsible for the letters and that he acted alone. Many people believe the FBI closed the case prematurely, or they based their investigation on preconceived notions. Lawrence Sellin, Ph.D., and others believe that while it could have been Ivan's, the case has yet to be thoroughly investigated. Furthermore, it's the belief of some that Ivan's mental issues, apart from his obsession with women, including the suicide, were a direct result of the investigation.
an English town is terrorized by a beast that appears to have a rooster's head and body, the wings of a bat, and a snake's tail. We'll look at the legend of the cockatrice when Weird Darkness returns. Terror began in January by the light of the full moon. The first scream came from the snowbound railway man who felt the werewolf's fangs ripping at his throat. The next month, there was a scream of ecstatic agony from the woman attacked in her cozy bedroom. Now, scenes of unbelievable horror unfold each time the full moon shines on the isolated main town of Tarker's Mills. No one knows who will be attacked next, but one thing is sure. When the full moon rises, a paralyzing fear sweeps through Tarker's mills, for snarls that sound like human words can be heard whining through the wind, and all around are the footprints of a monster whose hunger cannot be sated. Cycle of the Werewolf by Stephen King Hear the entire novel absolutely free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com Lights out for the devil and Mr. O. It is later than you think. supernatural and the supernormal, dramatizing the fantasies and the mysteries of the unknown. We tell you this frankly so that if you wish to avoid the excitement and tension of these imaginative plays, we urge you calmly but sincerely to turn off your radio now. This is Mr. O. Arch Obler. Uh, tell me, what is your attitude about worms? Yes, worms, those strange, slimy little creatures who come out in the dark and till your garden and sometimes die an unfortunate death on a fish hook. You really don't have any opinion about them? Well, perhaps you will after you hear my play, Revolt of the Worms. The action begins after a short message. In a sanctum mystery. This is your host, welcoming you through the squeaking door. Not for a half hour of terror, but to tell you about Radio Nostalgia Magazine. Radio Nostalgia Magazine is a must for old-time radio fans. It's the magazine with many photos and stories of old-time radio and its stars. Our current issue features a 16-page article on The Shadow. All subscribers will get a free Captain Midnight decoder badge, a Captain Midnight Flight Patrol membership, and a Flight Commander Certificate from the Secret Squadron. To get your copy, send $1.50 in check or money order to Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, 07087. That's Radio Nostalgia, Box 8007R, Union City, New Jersey, Zip 07087. Send now and get a free 8x10 photo of the Lone Ranger and Tano, boys and girls. And now, if you haven't already done so... Turn off your lights now and listen to Revolt of the Worms. All I can do is sit and think and wait. Wait for the floors to lift and the walls to crash. Facts. Think of facts. Yes, a journal of facts. Think how it began, why it's happening journal of facts until the walls crash in and the thick flesh. 
Charles Prentice. There's a fact. Chemist and fool. Fool. Run away. Run away. Run away. Run away, Run away from reality. War. 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 Run away. You mean we're going to live in this godforsaken place, Charles? Yes, Claire, I remember. You did say that. And I said... Of course we're going to live here. It's ideal for my work. But we're so far away from everything, Charles. So far away from what? Your friends, my friends? All right, Charles. Whatever you say, Charles. You never disagreed with me, did you, Claire? Why, it's so quiet up here, it's almost as if we are out of this world. Yes, I remember. Young Jackson, you did say that. I like working with you, sir. Why, up here, it's almost as if we were out of this world. Out of the world. I wanted to be out of the world. Hide. Until it's over. Yes, why not? Why not? What are you going all the way up there for, Prentice? To do my work, of course. But who cares about propagating new varieties of roses at a time like this? The times have nothing to do with it. I'll do what I please. I'll do what I please. But, Prentice, to leave suddenly like this, it doesn't make sense. Roses are fine in normal times, but a chemist of your ability? In times like these, certainly there's more productive work that you could do. I'm not interested in your opinions. I'll do what I please. You hear me? Do what I please. Do what I please. Yes, sir. Everything's ready, sir. Greenhouse. All ready for you, sir. One week ago, Wednesday. Does the wind always blow up here, Charles? Eh? I said the wind. Does it always blow like that? Why? Frightening. Mighty less frightening than the things that are happening back in the city? I suppose so. I know so. Where's that boy? Jackson. Yes, sir? The phosphates. Are they ready yet? Uh, not quite, sir. Well, get them ready. Every one of the plants. We work late tonight. Very late. Work late and hard. That was the answer to everything. Chemist of your ability. In times like these, there certainly must be more important work than propagating roses that you could do. A chemist of your ability. In times like these, there certainly must be more no, important No, I wouldn't think of that, I told myself. Wouldn't think of that. Roses. Yes, develop the greatest rose in the world. That would be my answer to them. While they bombed and burned, I'd develop the largest rose the world had ever known. And when the world settled down again, I'd come back and bring the rose to them, and they wouldn't care if I had run away. My plan. Why did it go wrong? Claire, why did it go wrong? Claire... Oh. Dead. You're dead. They killed you. Dead as I'll be dead. If I could only think, why did it go wrong? Well, I put the solution that's left over, Mr. Prentice. Yes, I do remember. That was it. Oh, gosh, Mr. Prentice, I'm trying to understand, but I'm so tired. You must keep working. The only salvation is to work. Oh, what's salvation got to do with roses? Don't be impertinent. Do your work. Yes, sir. Two cc for each plant, and careful, don't let any of it touch the stem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You weren't very happy, were you, Jackson? Those were things you couldn't understand. It, it isn't that I, I don't want to work, Mr. Prentice. It, it's just that I'm all mixed up. Uh, these roses. Why do I have to pour this stuff on them every hour on the hour? It doesn't make sense. Hormones? Sure, I know what they are. Secretions from the glands in the human body. Sure, I know what they're for. Make us grow and everything. I get it. That, that's what you try to do with the roses and make them grow fast and big. But how do you know these hormones will work on plants, Mr. Prentice? And how do you know how much to give them? And, and how big will the roses grow, Mr. Prentice? Questions. Everlasting questions. But now I ask them, why did it go wrong? Thursday. Thursday? What do I remember? Well, I throw the hormone mixture that's left over, Mr. Prentice. Mr. Prentice... I said, well, I throw the hormones... Go solution. away. Can't you see that I'm working? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. I remember. Friday. What a Friday. Friday night. Claire? Yes? Is that you? Yes, Charles. What are you doing walking out here in the dark? It's a lovely night. 
romantic at your age. I just like the night. You women, come back to the house. All right. Crazy, walking around in the dark. <laughs> that, oh, what's the matter with you? Can't you walk? If I hadn't caught you... It's slippery. What are you talking about? It's so slippery around here. Don't talk foolishness. But it is. By George, you're right. What? Stand still. I'll light a match. I had some... Yes. Now, we'll see what... Charles. Stop grabbing. What? <laughs> Worms. What? Well, can't you see? Just ordinary earthworms. Night crawlers. We just walked over a few of them. Now, oh, you women with your fears and your squeamishness. Walked on a few worms and you make more noise and more fuss. Yes. I remember. Friday night. The, the extra hormone solution, where'll I throw it, Mr. Prentice? Mr. Prentice, where'll I throw the extra hormone solution? Saturday. And then the night. Jackson! Jackson, where are you? Jackson, I told you to stay in the house. Jackson, where are you? It's time to feed the plants. Jackson, where are you? He's not I... here, Charles. Uh, Claire, you startled me walking up like that. I didn't mean to. That infernal boy, where is he? Have you seen him? He's not in the house. But I told him not to go out. I told him only an hour ago he's got to work all night. The plants must be watered every hour on the hour. He went out. Well, why didn't you stop him? Oh, I have to go chase after him. Jackson! Jackson, are you out there? Come in. Charles, what? Oh, well, what did you think it was? Thunder. It's starting to rain. Shut the door. Shut the door, I say. But the boy... If he hasn't the sense to come in out of the rain, it's just too bad. I've got enough to do with worrying about my roses without worrying about him. And don't you go out after him. He'll come back. He'll come back. Saturday night. And when it was day again... Charles, Charles, wake huh? up. Please wake up. Oh, where? You're on the couch. You fell asleep on the couch. Charles, oh. get up right away. Oh, what's the matter with you? Why should I get up? What difference does it make? Listen to me, please. The boy, he isn't back yet. What? Huh? Jackson, he isn't back yet. Charles, where can he be? The storm, you slept, I waited. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you looked in his room? I just came from there. Charles, where could he have gone to? All through the oh, storm. Oh, stop talking so much and let me get up. Go see. Oh. Must you follow me? Why didn't you wake me up? Why did you let me sleep? Uh, you must have fallen asleep, too. I opened my eyes. It was day. Oh, Charles. Oh, stop old Charlesing me. Crazy young fool, so he spent the night outside. So what's the difference? Teach him a lesson. Well... No wonder he isn't back yet. Fog like this, it's as bad as night. Charles, I... All right, all right. What am I supposed to do? Go wandering through fog like a bloodhound, like a fool? Don't worry, he'll be back. He'll be back. But you never did come back, did you, Jackson? When the sun came out and that everlasting wind came up and lifted the fog. Charles. Charles, come here. Where? Uh, where are you? Back of the house, Charles. Come quickly. Oh, oh, what is it? What do you want now? The boy isn't around. I've, I've looked everywhere. Charles, now, what... what's happened back here? What? Look at the ground. Well, what? Who plowed this ground up? Plowed? Yes, yeah, certainly plowed. Can't you see? Some crazy drunken fool plowed up the ground. But during the night... Charles, how could that be? You believe what you see, don't you? It's that boy. What? Yes, that Jackson went crazy, found a plow, tore up the ground, and ran away. Went out of his mind, that's it. The boy's gone crazy, tearing up the ground. Gone crazy. Gone crazy. Friends, we leave our The Devil and Mr. O story of Revolt of the Worms to take a deep breath and a word from your station. Reservations are now being accepted for cruises to the sun. Remarkable cruises on a ship longer than four city blocks with a crew of over 900. She's Queen Elizabeth II, the greatest ship in the world. Cruise with her this winter to the sun of islands like Curaçao and St. Thomas and Martinique. Room for room, she has the largest staterooms afloat, even duplexes. Three of the greatest restaurants in the world. 
there's more to see and do aboard Queen Elizabeth II than on many of the islands she visits. There are precious few ways in the world to get as much for your money. Cruise with her from New York to the Caribbean Sea. Cruising aboard Queen Elizabeth II. We wrote the book on it, and it's yours free. For your free copy and reservations, call your travel agent or Cunard at area code 212-297-6100. Queen Elizabeth II is a British registry. And now back to our The Devil and Mr. O story of Revolt of the Worms. And then that night... That same night after I thought Jackson had gone crazy, run away, I went back to my work Sunday night. Charles, Charles, can I speak to you? Charles, please stop your work and talk to me. Haven't you lived with me enough years to know I don't like to be interrupted when I'm working? But I'm frightened. Are you? Really? Charles, stop it. Are you out of your mind? Yes, maybe I am. What did you say? Maybe I am crazy. All right, maybe I am. That's the only way I could have lived with you all these years. What? Endured your selfishness, your unbelievable selfishness. Well... Everything's for you for 20 years, everything for you. Now, that's enough. Your work, your pleasures, what you think, what you want, everything for you, nothing for anyone else. Will you the shut up? The gentle little Mr. Prent is the scientist, the good husband who never lifts his voice. Mother in heaven, I'd rather be married to a fool with a heart in him than you. Well, I'm... You haven't got a heart. You never had a heart. It's you, you, and no one else, and that boy can be dead out there and you don't care, and I can be dead and you don't care as long as you're safe and doing what you want to do. Will you go away and let me go on with my work? <laughs> Charles, Charles, I'm fighting that boy. Now there are noises. I'm asking you for the last time to go away and let me do my work. But listen to me. You've been out here all night. But I've been in the back of the house alone, and I've been listening, and I didn't want to come in here, but I had to. Charles, things I said, I meant them. For years, I've meant them. All right, that doesn't matter. But I tell you this. There's something outside the house. Find out what it is, Charles. Twenty years ago, I thought you were an irrational woman. I thought I'd trained you out of that irrationality. I was wrong. I'll humor you just this once, but never again. Where are these noises? At the back of the house. The lantern handed to me? Yes. Thank you. You're frightened. You don't have to go with me. I want to know... What? That you're a fool? Well... So what am I supposed to hear? There's nothing. Hello out there. Hello. Well, what now? Listen. To what? Listen. To what? I... I thought... You heard the wind whistling through the cracks in your brain. Come into the house. Charles, wait. Wait for... Uh... Here? Yes. So what? Give me the lantern. If it's that boy... Well, it could be him, couldn't that it? That crazy young fool playing practical jokes. If I get around the corner of the house and... <gasps> him up there... What's going on here? Charles. Something moving under the ground. Yes. So dark. Can't... Quite make out. Charles, what is it? I don't know. I don't know. Animal of some sort? Take me back to the house. Oh, go yourself. Moon will come out of the clouds. See what this is. Give me the lantern, Charles. No, I want to see. The house is back there. Turn around and go back to it. Go ahead. All right. All right. Yes. It is something burrowing. Infernal moon come out, I'd see there. Coming out now, I'll see what... 
holes. Holes in the ground all over. What are they? Who? Bomb craters? But that isn't possible. No. Animal burrows. But what animal could make a hole four feet across? What animal? Claire! Where are you? Claire! So dark, I can't see you. Claire! Where are you? Claire! Claire! Where are you? Claire! Yes, Claire. Claire! I ran through the night looking for you. The echo of my voice is still in my ears. Looking for you and the moon was under the clouds and I couldn't see and I couldn't find you. And then I did. You had fallen into one of those craters. Into one of those holes in the ground. I couldn't see you, but I could hear you. But which one of the holes? They were all over ground, pockmarked with them. I ran around in the dark. I could hear you, but couldn't find you. And then the moon, it was out again. Oh, blast the moon. Why did it come out? If it hadn't come out, I wouldn't have seen. And my head... Stop it, stop it, stop it, Claire. Stop it. I can still hear you. I can still see you. Your body down in that hole. As I ran toward you, suddenly I saw that something else was coming toward you. Something that glistened wet in the moonlight. Something long and slimy. A great twisting snake. Yet not a snake. Not a snake. And the fear in me made me fall to the ground. And I saw as I lay there, I saw... The thing moved toward the hole in the ground as if you weren't there. As if it were blind and couldn't see. Like a great blind worm. It was a worm. A worm, ten, twenty, no, thirty feet long, crawling in fright to its home in the ground. And it moved toward you, Claire. Covered you. Crushed you. You're dead, Claire. You've been dead for two days. Why should I tear out of my memory all the horror of how you died? Of how young Jackson must have died? Where will I throw the extra hormone solution, Mr. Prentice? Where will I throw the extra hormone solution, Mr. Prentice? Yes. That's very funny, isn't it, Jackson? I ran away and I was going to bring back to the world the greatest rose. But I brought back the greatest worms. The hormones you threw away soaked into the ground and into them. Hundreds of little worms burrowing under the ground, soaking into their flesh, into their life process, miraculously increasing the growth of them. Until overnight they grew and grew without limit into those terrible horrors. And they are still growing. I can hear them. For the last two days, squirming around the house and over it, great monstrous pieces of slimy flesh squirming and writhing. Hundreds of them. Thousands of them. Burrowing under the ground and at night coming out of the ground. I have seen them. A sea of flesh. A sea of worms. Yes, I hear you out there, you worms. You were under the ground, and now there's no room underground for you, so you come out of the ground. The world was yours first, so now you're going to take it back again. The world for the world. You're under the house. You're lifting it. The walls will fall and crush me, and I'll be dead, and I want to be dead. Yes, now I know why this is happening to me. 
I thought I could run away from the world and what is happening in the world. You hear that, you worms out there? I thought I could run away. Window. Something behind me. A worm at the window. Head looking in. He's crawling in. And another following. And another. They're filling the room. Worms all around me. The worms. The worms. Worms covering cold flesh, wet flesh. Worms, the worms covering the worms. I know, I know what you're thinking. Worms that size, a pure put-on science fiction? Well, personally, I don't believe there's any such category of story as science fiction anymore. Our scientific progress has been so accelerated that what was fiction in the morning can actually happen tonight. Thirty years ago, long before human extinction became a possibility with the explosion of the first atom bomb... I wrote a play about the last two survivors in the world. At the time, it was sheer fiction. Something could happen to this earth of ours that would leave only two survivors, a writer's brainstorm. Yet who among us does not know cold reality, the red buttons east and west that could trigger off a global nightmare? I wrote another play a handful of decades ago that was equally an impossibility. It concerned the very laughable idea that a spaceship was returning from the moon after the first successful landing on that ball of cheese. Yet there are few among us today who haven't witnessed that first giant step on the lunar cinders and the very fantastic return voyage in triumph. Fantasy, fiction, fact, it's all interlaced into tomorrow. And speaking of the future, let me tell you about our next story. Its title is, Where Are You? And we'll talk about that after your station has a word. Dr. Campbell Moses, medical director of the American Heart Association, talks about a serious health problem in America today. Thousands of Americans die unnecessarily each year from heart attack because they don't know the symptoms and delay getting medical care. What are the symptoms? They vary, but they often start with a squeezing pain in the center of the chest behind the breastbone the pain radiating to the shoulder, arm, neck, or jaw. It's often accompanied by sweating and occasionally by nausea, vomiting, and shortness of breath. If this happens to you, don't delay. Call your doctor and carefully describe your symptoms. If you can't reach your doctor, get to a hospital emergency room as quickly as possible. Remember that frequently the symptoms of heart attack subside completely and then recur. In heart attack, minutes count, so act promptly. 
Helping you to feel better and live better longer is just one of the services of your heart association, just one of the reasons you should give to your heart fund. This is Mr. O again. First, to those who have inquired, yes, I've written a book. Its title is House on Fire. Its publisher, Bartholomew House. Now about our next play. It's all about a boy and a girl on a honeymoon. But even in our permissive times, I promise you the strangest honeymoon since that custom began. So next time, the play, Where Are You? Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. I'm Darren Marlar. Welcome back to Weird Darkness. Coming up later, a very strange case involving time travel and the power to change timelines. It was reported in 1977, and the case caused a sensation worldwide. Had Sid Herwick, the creator of the time-altering machine, really found a way to alter historical events? That's coming up in a few minutes. If you like what you're hearing here on Weird Darkness and you want even more, you'll want to check out the free audiobooks that I've narrated at WeirdDarkness.com. I've got free audiobooks there by Stephen King, H.P. Lovecraft, Robert Heinlein, and more. You can listen to them all for free on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. According to local legend, there was once a terrifying mythical creature that tortured the village of Werewell, Hampshire, England. The quiet village, which is located along the River Test, only has about 500 residents. But this small little village is also famous for a creepy monster that allegedly lurked around at one time. The legend states that a duck laid an egg in Werewell Abbey where it was hatched by a toad, and the baby turned into a cockatrice that had several different animal body parts. It appeared as a two-legged dragon-like monster with a rooster's head and body, the wings of a bat and a snake's tail. Locals cared for the baby creature until it grew to a massive size and began feeding on the villagers by flying over the land and grabbing people with its claws before bringing them to its lair where it would feed on them. Villagers were so scared of the beast, they offered four acres of land to anyone who could kill it. While numerous people died while attempting to rid the land of this monster, one local apparently accomplished the task as described. A man named Green polished a piece of steel until it gleamed like a mirror and lowered it down to the beast's lair. Upon seeing its reflection, the cockatrice fought until it was exhausted, and then Green ran the beast through with a javelin and claimed his reward. Today in Harewood Forest there is still an area known as Green's Acres. Oddly enough, trees don't grow at Green's Acres. This legend affected the locals so much that up until the 1930s, the older villagers would not eat duck eggs. Interestingly, the cockatrice has been mentioned in the Bible as well as by Shakespeare and even in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. 
Those living in Wherewell won't soon forget the legend of this terrifying cockatrice, as there was a weather vane in the shape of the monster that was on the Church of St. Peter and Holy Cross, which has since been moved to the Andover Museum. There are other references of the creature, such as on Andover High Street, in addition to two cockatrices decorating the coat of arms of Alfred of Werewell. It's a good thing the cockatrice was allegedly killed, as the legend has described it as being one terrifying monster. The ability to change the past and get an insight into the future is often resulted in the creation of the most remarkable time-altering machines. A very strange case involving time travel and power to change timelines was reported in 1977. The case caused a sensation worldwide. Had Sid Herwick, the creator of this time-altering machine, really found a way to alter historical events? Born in 1918, Sid Herwick was a Jewish appliance repairman living in Toronto, Canada, who used to experiment with various kinds of technology. As a child, Sid showed great interest in collecting random junk and assembling the pieces into working machines. Later, as an adult, he became famous as the man who could fix anything that was broken. In 1934, Sid earned the distinction of being the first private appliance repairman in all of Canada. He was such a skilled technician that the local power company succeeded in taking him out of the army so he could develop the infrastructure of the public electrical utility. Sid Herwick earned enough money to set up two successful companies of his own. He was still young when he got a heart attack, only 36, and he retired. Herwick continued to experiment with various tech devices, though, until one day he finally invented a remarkable device that could supposedly freeze or rather change the flow of time. This machine also had the ability to send out beams of influence to manipulate objects in distant locations. In 1969, a wave of bank robberies swept through Toronto, and local authorities had trouble catching the thieves. Herwick contacted the police and offered his help, saying it was possible to freeze time to find out what transpired. The article in the Vancouver Sun-Times gives this account. Quote, all I recall, said Bolton, one of the police officers in charge, is that it was under the table, the device, whatever it was, and there was a bedspread over the table. He froze my service revolver. You couldn't pull the trigger. You couldn't lift it up off the table, and even on the table you couldn't pull the trigger." Unquote. Sid responded to that by saying, now take a look at your watches. I remember one of them said, when did this happen? And I said, the minute you walked through that door, you walked in there about 25 minutes ago. Now look at your watches. You're late about 25 minutes. As the security officers filed out of his home, Sid's wife overheard one of them suggest that the army should be told about the device. That was the first time it entered my mind for war or army purposes or anything like that, he said. As is so often happens with new brilliant inventions, the time-altering machine was later used by the military or so it was reported. According to an article that appeared in 1977 in a British publication called Foreign Report, Sid Herwick's time-altering machine ended up in Israel, where it was used by the military. Quote, the device sends out electronic rays to alter the natural composition of electronic fields and centers of gravity of weapons, instrument dials, and mechanical devices. Using the Herwick principle, there was no reason why the new beams could not reach and disable tanks ground-to-ground missiles, and complete radar systems. The beams could also be tacked together to form a screen that would make whole zones safe from bombs and missiles," unquote, according to Foreign Report. Whether the time machine is still in possession of the Israel military or not has been widely debated. Does the Israeli military still have the Herwick device? Are they still using it on special occasions or in dire situations of military crisis? Skeptics say that if they really had a device, they could provide a kind of shield from bombs and missiles, freeze weapons, and even slow or halt time. The Israeli military would be invincible and would not have suffered as many casualties as it has in its decades-long struggles with antagonists in the Mideast. Others counter, however, by saying that the Herbic device might be a two-edged sword. If it can freeze the weapons of the enemy, it would also freeze the weapons of those employing the device. Thus, the device can perhaps only be used in a limited way, 
enough to knock out radar detection and other enemy electronics, for example, but not to induce the full-blown time freeze effect for the benefit of the user. Although many people have written and speculated about this time-altering device of Sid Herwick over the years, there has never been a follow-up story since it appeared in the Vancouver paper back in 1977. What happened to Sid Herwick is also unclear. By now, he has assuredly passed on, but it's interesting to note the researchers have not been able to find his obituary or any information about him. It's as if he vanished into thin air. When he talked to the police, he said, it's not really a new invention. It's designed on principles that are already well known. I just thought of it one day. When I heard about the bank robberies, I knew this could work. The time-altering machine created by Sid Herwick could be one of the world's greatest inventions, but its whereabouts are shrouded in mystery, perhaps deliberately. I'm someone who prefers their cats live, not mummified. However, when I came across a story on the topic which includes the phrase, right of inheritance, <laughs> I take notice. From the Lansing State Journal, September 24, 1926, Harrodsburg, Kentucky. The question of ownership of a mummified cat and kitten found in the wall of a century-old house being torn down here is causing wide interest and some agitation. There are three people who claim the relics. Barry Lawson, tearing away the residence of Dr. J.T. Price, found the mummified felines walled into the building. It was evident the mother cat and kitten had been caught in the space inside the wall, unknown to workmen who had built around them. This was early in the last century. Lawson took the curious remains, and so many persons clamored to see them, it was reported a small admission fee was charged. The question of ownership arose when Lawson claimed the mummies by right of discovery and proprietorship of the house. Dr. Price said the cats belonged to him as he sold the house to Lawson, but not the contents of the building. The third claim has attracted the most attention of all. Beriah McGoffin of McAllister, Oklahoma, who has been spending the summer here, says the cat's remains belong to him by right of inheritance. The old house was built by his grandfather, Beriah McGoffin, the first father of Beriah McGoffin II, who was governor of Kentucky during the Civil War and held Kentucky as neutral ground in that struggle. Mr. McGoffin says the first Beriah had a pet cat whose mysterious disappearance became a family legend, handed down to the generations. The mummy cat, he believes, is the lost feline of his grandfather, and he wants to link the past and present to that extent anyway. Well, unfortunately, or now that I think of it, maybe fortunately, I wasn't really able to learn who finally won possession of the earthly remains of these tragic, if highly prized, mummy cats. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there's the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Adventures in Time and Space, told in future tense. Dimension X. Can you predict what will come in 100 years or in 10? 
or in the next minute. Can you see beyond the known dimensions of time and space into the unknown dimension X? It was in the year of 1982 that spacemen first discovered the great galactic barrier. In the past 10 years, rocket travel to the moon and the nearer planets had become commonplace. And then men fixed their sights on a more distant star, the remote planet known as Volta. Five exploratory ships went out, and none came back, each in turn disappearing mysteriously at the same vanishing point, an invisible wall somewhere in the vast outer reaches that became known as the wrecker of spaceships, the Galactic Reef. And yet, the explorers refused to admit defeat. It was on June the 2nd, 1987, that the rocket Star Cloud made ready for takeoff, the sixth to attempt to crack the barrier and win through to Volta. Now here it is. Condition blue. One minute to blast off. Now here it is. Condition blue. One minute to blast off. Bridge to nav control. Navigation, call you. This is Captain Thorson. Ready, Lieutenant? We're ready, Captain. The course is in the integrator for takeoff at 1,200 hours. All right, stand by for acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Fire up your rocket chambers. Take off at exactly 1,200 hours. I'll read you off. 30 seconds. 29. 28. 27. 26. Condition red. Hold it. Revoke all orders. Who turned in that alarm? We've uncovered a stowaway, sir. Stowaway where? I think it's sick bay. Dr. Spitzland found him. Have him brought up to the bridge. Engine room, kill your rockets. Stand by. Thorson, this is Colonel Harrison in ground control. What's holding you up? Trouble. What's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? There's stowaway aboard. Stowaway? Yes, I thought your men were supposed to police this base. What's the matter with you? All right, Captain, take it easy. You know what this delay can do to us, don't you? One minute later, takeoff can throw us a million miles off course. We'll have to reintegrate the whole works. Well, look, how long do you think it'll take? Don't bother me for a while. I'm busy here. Stupid idiot. Come in. Here's your stowaway, eh, sir. Now, court martial. Charlie. Ken, uh, you use a good radio man, Skipper? Oh, I see you two have met. Met? The Skipper and me made 50 trips to the moon together. Didn't we, Captain? Charlie, if you wanted to come along, why didn't you volunteer? I did, Skipper. They turned me down. What's wrong with you? Oh, acceleration bends. They said my arteries wouldn't stand another trip. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. But they're wrong, sir. I got one more good trip in me. Now, listen, Captain. You know these green kids don't know the first thing about space radio operation. Now, you put a man like me on, and I'll be getting you bedtime stories from Mars. Well, you know the regulations as well as I do, Charlie. I can't take you as much as I'd like to. Colonel Harrison will murder me for this. I'm sorry, Charlie. I have to put you aground. Tell you what, Charlie, I'll ask Harrison to put you on his ground radio contact. It'll seem as if you're right here with us. He won't do it, sir. He better. I'll have him busted to corporal for letting you sneak aboard. You'll be better off, Charlie. Paulison. Yes, sir. I'm sending a man down from the bridge. Put him aground. Give him time to clear the launching platform. Yes, sir. So long, Charlie. I'm sorry. Well, good luck, Skipper. Thought you were going to have him drawn and quartered. And anybody else, I would have, Smitty. But Charlie, well, Charlie's kind of special. He's been with me since my first command. When we began the regular run to the moon. If he wanted to come along this time, well, it's only through loyalty to me. You know, Lewis, I didn't realize it before, but you're almost human. Navigation. Lieutenant Collier. Nav control, Collier. Lieutenant, how badly we fouled up. Can you recalculate the course? Or shall I cancel the takeoff? I've already plotted a new course on the integrator, sir. Well, that's quick work. Are you sure? Positive, sir. All right, Collier. Putting it in your hands. We'll blast off in your signal. But Lewis, isn't that a lot of responsibility for a young green officer? Yeah, but if he can't do his job, I'd rather find out now than at the galactic barrier. Bridge to engine room. Ready your rockets. Prepare to blast off on navigator signal. <laughs> How are we doing, Collier? Coming on the bearing, sir. Uh -huh. Four, three, two, zero. 
We've intersected the course vector. That's good work, Carter. Course corrected, sir. Ready to go into atomic overdrive anytime you say. All right, stand by. Now hear this. Prepare for maximum acceleration. Bridge to engine room. Kill your rockets. Rockets out. Fire up number one cyclotron. Number one ready. Fire up number two. Number two ready. Engineering, withdraw your dampening rods. Mission chamber ready. Last tubes are clear. Ready. Take it on overdrive. How are we doing, Collier? On course, sir. She's running hot and true. Well, my compliments, Lieutenant. This job would have done your father credit. He was the best navigation officer I ever saw. Thank you, sir. Start your gyros, put her on robot control. All right, the ship is yours, Mr. Collier. If you need me, I'll be in Dr. Smithson's office. Yes, sir. Thank young Collier for that. Chip off the old block. Oh, you knew his father, huh? Matter of fact, I knew him very well. First-rate spaceman. Is he the one who... Yeah, uh... yeah. Oh. yeah, he was lost in the galactic barrier on the second ship we sent out to Boulder. Lewis, uh, just what do you think this galactic barrier is? Uh, your guess is good as mine, Doc. All I know is that five ships have gone into it, and none of them have come back out. You think it's an it? Uh, how about Mestrovic's theory that it's a time warp in space, but that the ships reach it and slip into another dimension? I think that's rubbish. My theory is that the galactic barrier is nothing more than a radioactive layer of some kind. What makes you say that? Well, we know that radar signals bounce off it like they were hitting an invisible glass wall. And we know it destroys our ships and our crews in some way. Uh, there's no other logical explanation. What makes you think we can get through it? Because we're ready for it. The others weren't. Tire hull is completely shielded with lead. We can crack through any radioactive cloud ever detected. Besides, we're equipped with some new UHF radio devices that should enable us to maintain radio contact with Earth. Nothing can happen. Absolutely nothing. Who are you trying to convince, Lewis? <laughs> Myself, I suppose. Smitty, five ships are missing. And men like Prentice and Margetson and young Collier's father... I'm tired of seeing good men fed into that meat chopper. Then why are we going? We haven't any choice, Minnie. We're in a race. The kind of race where men and ships are expendable. Well, at least it won't be boring. I'll have to play physician morale builder and mother substitute for 112 slightly nervous men. <laughs> Your morale doesn't sound too good, Doctor. As morale officer, I can state without fear of contradiction. It's terrible. And something tells me that as we approach that galactic barrier, I'm not going to be alone. Hello, Earth. Hello, Earth. Captain Thorson of the Star Cloud calling Earth. Star Cloud to Earthbound. Can you read me? Hello, Star Cloud. Hi, Captain. Charlie. Well, I see they haven't court-martialed you yet. No, sir. Thanks to you. Well, Charlie, it's good to hear you. You can read us the funny papers on Sunday morning. Right. How's the signal? Strong. Clear the bell. All right. Here's our log report for Colonel Harrison. Ready? Shoot. June 2nd, 1987. Four weeks out from Earth. Running true. No radiation. Operation normal. Still making our approach to the galactic barrier. That's all, Charlie. See you later. Good luck, Captain. I sure wish I was with you. Uh, how's the morale, Smitty? Well, uh, the men know we're getting closer to the barrier. They're beginning to show a little tension, Lewis. How's their physical condition? Any sickness? About half the crew has come down with space blues. Badly? Oh, same as usual. Lips and hands with a bluish cast. Eyes sensitive to infrared. I don't know. When I first started flying these tin cans, nobody ever heard of space blue. Well, there's a new theory that is caused by the terrific acceleration of these atomic overdrive ships. Uh, the change in gravity affects the circulation. What do you think? Oh, I think it's psychosomatic. I've noticed that the same men who get space blues under tension on a ship tend to get blue coloration back on Earth when they're upset. I guess it's an occupational disease of space navigators. You think it's just nerves, then? I don't know. 
But young Collier has a bad case. I think it's tension from overwork. Maybe he needs some vitamins. Lewis, when will you realize that vitamins are not a panacea for all the troubles of mankind? Come in. Oh, Lieutenant Carmen. Sir, I understand you've relieved me from duty. Dr. Smithson says that you aren't looking very well. I'm giving you a rest. I feel perfectly able to continue, sir. Your lips are as blue as Minnetonka. I'd like to remain at my post, Captain. Don't be foolhardy, Lieutenant. I'm not being foolhardy, sir. I have a special personal reason for wanting this expedition to reach Volta. Your father? Yes, sir. You think he might still be alive? I have to find out what happened, sir. I think I understand. Very well, Collier. Report back to duty. What's the reading, Paulison? We're getting a plus five radar bounce now. It's coming off the barrier almost as fast as we send it out. What's the interval? Three-tenths of a second. Shortening steadily. At this rate, we'll hit the wall in the next few minutes. All right, alert the crew. Sound general quarters. Now hear this. Condition red. We are now approaching the galactic barrier. All hands to stations. All radiation detectors to be fully manned. Full security will prevail until further notice. That is all. Paulison. Aye, sir. Radar bounces up to plus six. We better try to make final contact with Earth. Spark still trying to raise the base? Yes, sir, but he's not having much luck. There seems to be some interference. That's the radio room now. Yes? You've got him? Cut in the bridge speaker. The captain will take it from here. Hello. Star cloud to Earthbound. Can you hear me, Earth? Hello, Skipper. I can barely read you. We're getting heavy static from sunspots. That's not sunspots. We're right on top of the galactic barrier. Stick with us, Charlie. We're switching to the automatic sender now so you can track us in. Okay. If we crack the barrier and come through still in one piece, I'll try to get back to you on the high frequency band. Good, the skipper. Don't worry. I'll be waiting. So long, Charlie. So long, Star Cloud. We must be getting awfully close now, Captain. The echo's bouncing back so fast it's almost beating the signal. When they coincide, hold under your hat. That's when we run into the wall. Any second. Hold on. Well, here goes nothing. Here it comes. Captain? Why? Why, nothing happened. We made it. <laughs> we made it, Captain. No radiation, no time warp, no nothing. <laughs> hey, the crew's gone crazy, sir. Let them. They earned it. Say, Doc. Doc. Can you break out a few bottles of snake bite serum for medicinal purposes? I sure can. Lewis. This calls for a celebration. How's your morale now? Couldn't huh? be better. How's yours? <laughs> Condition hey, what? Red. What is detected? Condition red. Radiation detected. Good. Holy mackerel! Look at the needle on that indicator. Paulson, Paulson. I see it, Captain. We're picking radiation like crazy. What's it like? It's a strong wave. What kind is it? I don't know. It's too long for a cosmic ray and too short for UHF. All right, track it down. Triangulate it. Make it fast. I want a directional fix. Yes, sir. Engine room. Yes, sir. We're picking up radioactivity. Is it the fission chambers? No leak, sir. Check your gauges. Nothing here, Captain. Must be coming from outside. Damage control. Yes, sir. Is our lead shield leaking radiation? Haven't found anything yet, sir. All right, keep at it. Paulison, how are you doing? I've got a fix, Captain. Well, what is it? I have to recheck my figures. Well, hurry up. The angle is correct, but I don't... Come on, man, for Pete's sake. It's right, sir. What's right? Speak up. Where's the radiation coming from? It's coming from inside the ship. That's impossible. No, sir. I've checked it twice. Well, then, there's only one thing left to do. Paulison, get a Geiger counter. We're going to start combing the ship inch by inch. Ready, sir. All right, turn it on now. Yes, sir. Uh, we'll check the atomic guns first. Cut through the officer's quarters to ordinance. Come on. Wait a minute, sir. What is it? The signal's weaker now. Let's go back. Seems strongest right about here. It doesn't make sense. Whose cabin is it? Lieutenant Collier's. Collier? It's probably down in nav control, sir. Try the door. Well, it's not locked, sir. It's in here, all right. Listen to that counter. Strongest over here. Open that wall cabinet. It's locked. Smash it. All right, shut off the Geiger counter. 
What do you make of this, Pollinson? It looks like some sort of portable transmitter, sir. Must be foreign manufacture. I don't recognize the calibration symbols at all. Never seen anything like it. Which raises a small question. What is Lieutenant Collier doing with a transmitter in his cabin? I don't know, sir. Well, I intend to find out, Pollison. Get down to nav control. Bring Collier up to the bridge. On the double. Well, hadn't we better find some way to shut this thing off first? I know a way. Lieutenant Collier, I'm going to ask a few simple questions, and I want a few simple answers. Yes, sir. What were you doing with a transmitter in your cabin? Transmitter, Captain? You know nothing about it? No, sir, I don't. Do you recognize these calibration symbols? No, sir. Can you think of how it might have been placed in your cabin without your knowing it? No, sir. Unless someone came in while I was on duty. Would that have been possible? Why, uh, I suppose if, uh, if someone had a key... I uh... found your cabin door unlocked. Well, I meant a key to the wall cabinet. I didn't say the wall cabinet. Well, well, sir, I... You what, Lieutenant? How could you have known it was in the wall cabinet? I just assumed. Lieutenant Collier, I find it hard to believe you would lie, having known and respected your father and having observed the way you handled your job. However, I intend to get to the root of this thing. May I have your wristwatch, Lieutenant? Sir? Your wristwatch. Yes, sir. Wallison, turn on that Geiger counter. Yes, sir. Hold this watch next to it. Yes, sir. That's all. Lieutenant, if you hadn't any close contact with that transmitter, how do you explain the radioactivity of this watch? I don't, sir. I think you'd better. To whom are you sending those signals? Condition red! Condition red! There's your answer, Captain. What is this, Collier? Alien spaceship approaching! Alien spaceship approaching! Sound battle stations. Collier, who's aboard that ship? All right, now talk, man! Very well, Captain. My mission seems complete. Your mission? Are you admitting that you're an agent of a foreign power? I am stating it. What nation? No nation, Captain. What? I am an agent of the Voltan government. The what? The government of the planet of Volta. You're crazy. Are you so stupid that you think your people are the only ones who can invade another planet? What do you mean? We've had agents operating on Earth since 1945. I don't believe you. What do you think happened to those five ships, Captain? Where do you suppose we got our information, your language, your culture, family background? But your appearance, you look... Like Commander Collier? Is that so surprising, Captain? We had a living model. I ought to kill you. That would be very foolish. I would advise you to surrender without delay. Alien ship now coming in ordnance range. I'll deal with you later, Collier. Follison, sir. Put this man in irons. Take him away. Don't worry, sir. We'll take good care of him. Carpenter. Robinson. Gunnery. Gunnery Richardson. What's the range? 10,000 meters are closing fast. Put your guns on radar tracking. Tracking. Coming on a bear. Fire. Fire. Richardson, you hear me? Fire. What's the matter down there? Did you hear me? Richardson, answer me. It's no use to shout, Captain. Collier. Yes, Captain. How'd you get loose? Where's Pollison? Lieutenant Pollison is dead. All stations. Lieutenant Lieutenant Collier Collier has escaped. escaped. Seize him, man. Don't waste your breath. Your men can't hear you, Captain. What? Those still alive are my men. You're lying. No, Captain. Every ship that has ever left Earth was controlled by a Voltan crew. That's impossible. Those were hand-picked men. Hand-picked by us. I don't believe you. Then why not call for help? Carpenter, Carpenter, Robinson, Robinson, Haley, report. report. Carpenter, Carpenter, Robinson. Robinson. You see, Captain, it is quite useless. I would advise you to sit very quietly and do nothing. It isn't possible. They can't all be dead. Smitty! Dr. Smithson! Smitty! Smitty, what have they done to you? you I, oh, those dirty... Uh, don't, don't talk, Smitty. They're closer. Not much don't time. Blues. Space blues. Space blues. What is it, Smitty? Uh, what are you trying to tell me? All men with space blues... Voltan. Here, let me help you, Smith. No, Lewis. Get message back to Earth. Voltan. Fifth column. Watch out for space blues. Uh, Smitty. Smitty. Hello. Hello. Star cloud calling Earth cloud. We 
please. And God let me get through before it's too late. Hello, star cloud to earthbound. Come in, please. Come in, please. Hello? Hello, can you hear me, Charlie? Skipper, is that you? Are you getting my signal? It's coming in a little louder now, Skip. Keep sending. Thank God, Charlie. Now listen to me. Not much time. It's word to Colonel Harrison. Crew mutinied. Most of crew members, Bolton. What? Bolton. Spell that. B-O-L. Bolton? That's right. They're from the planet Boulder. Skipper, are you all right? Charlie, this is serious. They'll be here any second. Now listen. They have a fifth column on Earth. They're planning to invade you. You don't mean it. I get you. Step back in, Charlie. I'm depending on you now. Warn everybody. Captain. They've opened the door. Go on, Charlie. Tell Captain. Captain Thorson. Hello. Hello, Star Cloud. Come in. What's the trouble, Sergeant? We're just trying to raise the Star Cloud, Colonel. Had any luck? Uh, no, sir. No contact. No contact? No, sir. Hmm. Nearly an hour since they hit the galactic barrier. I don't understand why they haven't tried to get back a message. No, sir. Neither do I. All right. I'll take over for a while. Yes, sir. Go right ahead, sir. You'd better go out and get yourself some coffee. Charlie, you look a little blue around the gills. just heard No Contact, an adventure in time, space, and the unknown. Dimension X. Next week, we have a nice, blood-curdling little story that starts with these two sentences. The last man alive on Earth sat alone in a room. And then... There was a knock on the door, which raises the question, what knocked on the door? Left to its own devices, the human mind supplies a vaguely horrible answer. But it wasn't so horrible, really. You'll see next week when we present Knock. Tonight, Dimension X has presented No Contact. An original story written by George Lefferts from the storyline by Lefferts and Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Wendell Holmes as Captain Thorson, Lawson Zervey as Lieutenant Collier, and John McGovern as Dr. Smithson. Your host was Norman Rose. Music by Albert Berman. Engineer Bill Chambers. Dimension X is produced by Van Woodward and directed by Edward King. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please, share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness, aside from the old-time radio shows, are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio.